So welcome everyone to today's Hindi Julian translation. Um, speaking of which, I should probably start the, the translation element. Um, so you should all now see at the bottom of your Zoom screen next to where it says reactions, there should be a button called interpretation and you can choose to listen to this entire event in either English or Hindi, depending on your preference. Um, so my name is Manishay Burgis and I'm the head of the public program here at the AA. And this jury is the third of its kind to be held as part of the architecture and translation project that launched at the beginning of 2020. Um, so the Architectural Association is a school with more than 81 nationalities and we created this project to celebrate the wealth embedded in different languages in the production and dissemination of different forms of research within architecture. The project aims to identify terms, concepts and values inherent to different linguistic and cultural contexts to produce a multilingual dictionary of architectural terms for the 21st century. For those of you joining us from outside the school, juries are part of AA terminology referring to student presentations to a panel of experts who provide constructive feedback on work in progress that is presented. The first jury in translation was held in January 2020 in Mandarin and English to coincide with the Lunar New Year celebrations. And it was there that we realized that there weren't clear translations for maybe more political words like protest. And it allowed us to question what the more nuanced alternatives in Mandarin might mean for the projects being discussed. Um, the next jury was held in February 2020 in Arabic and English, and it provided for a really rich conversation on the poetic way people express themselves in Arabic and how that changed the way both presenters and critics express their ideas about architecture. So the expression, Mary Bashon Kisima he Mary Sansa Kisimai he, which means the limits of my language are the limits of my world, is what these juries aim to address, to question why we only use English in the making of projects, and how by describing architecture in other languages, we can expand both our vocabulary and imagination for what these projects could be. So today we have six students from across different units and programs at the school who are presenting their projects in progress in a mixture of Hindi and English to a panel of interdisciplinary critics who will give feedback on the work in a combination of the two languages as well. I'm really in awe of everyone who is presenting in Hindi today and I'm grateful for their willingness to take on this challenge despite originally producing this work in English. Embarrassingly, despite growing up in India and learning Hindi in school, my own language skills are woefully inadequate. So my comments will be restricted to English and I'm sort of overcompensating with my outfit. And um, I guess the, it's an important point to raise because it's, it's kind of proof of how in, dominant English has become in the world at the cost of the richness, nuanced meaning and culture embedded in so many other languages. So the aim of juries like today is a sort of experiment to test out how projects produced in English can or cannot be translated and really to celebrate what is gained in finding new ways to express ideas, in this case in Hindi, to describe design and spaces through the act of translation. So each student will have around eight to 10 minutes to present, followed by 20 minutes of feedback from the panel. I'll try to keep to time so there's enough discuss time for discussion at the end. And um, the entire event is being simultaneously translated between Hindi and English by our two incredible and experienced translators, Amina Saif and Nazneen Lakhani. So for the audience, as I mentioned before, at the bottom of your screens, if you press on the interpretation button, you can toggle between Hindi and English to listen to the event in the language of your choice. So to briefly introduce our panel of critics, um, Pooja Agrawal is an architect and planner who works as a public servant at Homes England and previously at the Greater London Authority, Publica, and we made that. She's a co-founder of Social Enterprise Public Practice and co-host of Spatial Equality Platform Sound Advice. And as mentioned, they actually gave a lecture as part of the public program last night. Uh, Samuel Barkley is co-founder and principal of Case Design, a Mumbai-based architecture and design office, which he co-founded in 2013 with his wife, Erica. And in addition to his experience in the design and construction of architectural projects, he's worked on furniture, interiors, and exhibitions and founded the brand Case Goods in 2015. Salim Batri is the director of product design at Case Design, and his furniture is in the permanent collection of the Centre Georges Pompidou, Paris. Uh, he was director at Plain, founding program director of product design at ISDI Parsons, Mumbai, and head of design at Reliance Brands. Shumi Bose is a teacher, curator, and editor based in London. She's a senior lecturer in architecture at Central St. Martins and visiting lecturer, lecturer at the Royal College of Art. 
Shumi has worked as a curator of exhibitions at both the Venice Biennale and at the Royal Institute of British Architects. Suthi Ramesh is an independent graphic designer based in London and starting her career at leading design studios such as Pentagram, Whedon and Kennedy, Made Thought and Brown's Design, she now runs a small design practice in London. She's also a co-founder of Nicety Materials, a digital library for physical materials. And then last but not least, Rashid bin Shabib is an urbanist and researcher of cities across the Middle East and North Africa. Working with his brother Ahmed, they founded Brown Book, a magazine that documents cities across the region. They've curated several exhibitions and collaborations, including the UAE National Pavilion at the upcoming 17th Venice Architecture Biennale. And embarrassingly, despite growing up in Dubai, they speak better Hindi than I do. And so if you want to know more about each of these amazing people, you can read their bios on their website. Um, and I'll post the link to the event in here. Um, I'm really looking forward to this event and to the discussion to follow. Good luck to all our presenters. And I'll now hand over to our first presenter, Anayata Brambat, who will be presenting her project in Diploma Unit 4 titled Cosmopolitical Contestation of Salt. Hello, Namaste, Namaskar, Rubharam. Sharing my screen now. Please let me know if you can see my screen. Yes. Um, Today, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you about my project, which is Cosmopolitan Constellation of Salt. I am Gujarati, and my mother tongue is Gujarati, and my Hindi is little bit is English, Gujarati, and Hindi mixture. So please apologize me. Um, my project deals with salinity as a condition in the state of Gujarat in India. Gujarat is the westernmost territory um, of India. And right now what you're looking at on the screen is a digital elevation model showing zero to nine meters um, of elevation above sea level, black being zero. Um, what you, what most in, the most interesting factor of this um, image or model is the center gray dot that you see in the middle of, of the white that explains the geological condition of Gujarat, which shows that the two gulf, the two gulfs on the south and the north used to come together um, and, and were um, connected by the sea. So that the, the dot is a saltwater lake in Gujarat that indicates the um, intrusion of the sea during the Holocene, during the geological epoch of the Holocene. Here, uh, this model right, uh, shows water occurrence and seasonality in Gujarat, um, where there, whereby two rivers form an estuary near the Gulf of Kutch or uh, Kutch ka Registan, jise bolte hai, jo, Desert uh, of Kutch, uh, which is cold. Um, Tidal, tidal uh, conditions say banta hai, or it, it, it forms from the tidal conditions. It's a condition that is constantly evolving. Um, and the, on the southernmost territory, you see three rivers combining into the Gulf of Kambat into the sea. Here, um, so just giving you an overview of the project, it deals with salinity as a condition, as a temporal, con temporal condition as a political condition um, in Gujarat and what are, and the implic and the urban and the rural and the geological and the metaphysical conditions that arise due to a very simple ecological um, condition of salinity is what I'm studying in my project. These images that you have been seeing are, um, are uh, derived from um, are derived and elaborated from um, remote uh, sensing, are derived and elaborated with remote sensing strategies involving um, various satellite imagery and then combining them to create models 
of um, elaboration. Mitti ke baare mein baat kare to about the soil. Uh, if I talk soil, soil is this that we all are surrounded by and are engulfed by. Um, to understand soil better, I conducted an experiment that imaged soil health, that, that um, imaged the condition of soil health onto a piece of paper. This involves a chemical reaction um, conducted between uh, sodium hydroxide and um, imaging into imaging the solution into a photosensitive material to give results or show images of soil health ranging from top soil to soil that has been extremely eroded in a very um, degraded condition. Understanding soil, um, I was um, thinking of soil as a as a condition of total evolution and a condition of constant change. Whereas if um, also considering Gujarat as a territory, my interest lied in how the territory of Gujarat has constantly evolved with um, uh, conditions of empire being imposed upon it. And finally, you have the state in its current condition in 1960 being separated from the Bombay presidency in 1956. So what I was trying to understand more sensitively was how territory is not a bound condition. It is not a permanent condition and so is not soil. They both are constantly evolving and are constantly in collision and cohesion with each other. Talking of Gujarat's basic facts, Gujarat is four times the size of Switzerland and has about 50 spoken languages and the longest coastline in the country. Port and sea, these two factors combine to form the cosmopolis of Gujarat. Gujarat has been and always was a, a, a state of vepar or vyapar. The condition of business or Trade. origins in Gujarat from the 5th and 6th century BCE with um, trade routes from the North and North Asian countries to the Middle East and sea routes from Europe, both by passing Gujarat where Surat was the, uh, was, was the port of uh, where, where, whereby traders and businessmen used to gather and trade. So the history of trade and commerce in Gujarat lies far behind its current depositions. Currently, the idea of port is constantly changing with these notions of the uh, Delhi to Mumbai freight corridor, which involves um, incentivized urbanism on the coasts, incentivized urbanism inland, and of course, the Sagar Mala project proposing coastal economic zones in the country. So the idea of the port, which is constantly evolving, has also remained the same. Thinking of the Gulf of Kutch on the southern territory of Gujarat, sorry, Gulf of Kambat on the southern territory of Gujarat, here uh, is the maximum um, area covered by mangroves in the state. And um, ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization, recently conducted a survey showing erosion of mud flats um, occurring between 2014 to 2017, showing the temporality or the sensitivity of the region. And of course, um, when, one, when we think of Gujarat, the first and the most asthir or asthai condition, the unsteady condition of the run or of the, of the run of Kutch comes to mind. The Kutch is a region lying on the territory of India and Pakistan. It is a contested region. It's an uninhabited region. The change, change as a condition is observed on a daily basis in this region because of um, the constant collisions between land and sea. Here, um, what we can see most is this basically Kutch is an open flat desert of 
just salt and there is about 70% of production of salt happens on the run or the desert the kutch exists because of an earthquake happening in 189 1819 which formed a natural barrier between the borders of pakistan and india um that led to uh, the indus river not flooding um this very sensitive region and because of because of the natural barrier right now you have a desert that uh, that that initiates and and um propagates trade of salt in in the uh, in the region in the state and in the country so what came to my mind is why is the ocean salty i was most i was more interested in the condition of salt samudra khara kyun hai to why the ocean is salty uska jawab lane ke liye maine samjha ki in order to get the reply i understood that the river which flows topography se behkar jab um rock when the river flows from the high high to went to the rock and then they collect salt and they come to the ocean and on the ocean bed uh, the wind so the hydrothermal vents on the ocean floor it releases various salts into the into the ocean resulting in the ocean being salty and hence resulting in various conditions of salt and salinity in various parts of the world including gujarat so right now what you are looking at is a composite image showing salinity or kharapan um in gujarat where you can see that it does not just exist in the two coastal regions but it is spread out the white is say white is saline regions of the state and as you go kind of more grayer to more darker more non saline regions here you can see that salinity as a condition is not a uh, kind of isolated it exists um uh, horizontally throughout different topographical conditions and so i was kind of more interested in the idea of um these these various topographical conditions and the existence of salinity in the coast as well as inland and i visited various sites uh, near nal sarovar the lake which i pointed out in my first slide which, which shows uh, which is basically a salt water lake and it exists because the two gulfs were um, surrounded or were were both combined and formed the sea at a point so here you can see notions of salinity where the soil is absolutely degraded and absolutely white with no um with no um, care taken to to maintain it um here you can see like there are kind of certain beautiful vistas that you can see as well but also yes there are migratory birds that come and 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 use that as a home but of course it's the soil is degraded it's dying so this happens because of condition called salinity ingress which means that um, the intrusion of salt water into the ground uh, ground water uh, sorry uh, ground water uh, aquifers results in salinity ingress and then of course that also increases soil salinity and it can be measured using um an instrument that measures electrical conductivity because um salt water conducts electricity and hence you can measure different uh, saline regions using um electrical conductivity and thinking of salt more politically um i see it as two different conditions the idea of uh march and the idea of gandhi walking to uh the uh, to a beach called dandi in gujarat on the 12th march 1930 picking up salt from the beach and symbolically breaking the salt law just by picking up some salt from the beach gandhi symbolizes freedom he symbolizes azadi he symbolizes self reliance freedom the, the colonial law of uh, salt tax did not even allow indians to pick up salt from the beach that is a crucial political 
um, event in the history of salt in the history of India. Um, different notions of Atmanirbharta or self-reliance are seen today in India with new progressive, quote, quote unquote, progressive projects of special economic zones and industrial corridors that support manufacturing and production are seen popping around in the entire country. These regions are, especially in Gujarat, are highly saline. The land that is saline is represented underdeveloped or degraded officially in, gov in, in um, government um, literature and is sold at highly cheap prices. This results in land pooling mechanisms where, uh, where, whereby land is bought at very cheap prices because of an existing condition of salinity. And hence it, relates, it, and hence it relate, results in new urbanisms, in new destructive urbanisms, in new copied urbanisms from the West. This is a project called the Dholera uh, Special Investment Region in Gujarat. And here you can see it's been going on for the past 20 years. It's still not completed and there is no sign of completion as government fundings are constantly in evolution, so to speak. Um, these projects have images of progression, but they symbolize and they indicate degradation. There are farmers who are constantly protesting and not giving up land and their fights are going unrecognized by, by the government. So salinity ingress has been a constant and a very destructive condition in Gujarat and it is a very it is a contested condition. It's an urban condition. It is not a condition of the rural. It is not a condition of the countryside. It is an urban condition. As India moves to moves towards high urbanization, ecological and climate climatic conditions play a role in how uh, India will urbanize. There have been special reports that have been done to solve problems of salinity on the coast, but they have not been implemented and there are farmers and there are communities that are still, still suffering incredibly on the coast of Gujarat. The Incredible India project lies on the crossroads of urbanization, climate change, Atma Nirbharta and um, Hindutva. It lies on the it lies on these crossroads, but it's it's yet to be defined. It's not defined by any of these. It suffers from conditions of poverty, suffers from conditions of climate change, increase in heat, increase in salinity, unregulated urbanisms. So. Uh, this is what I was interested in in my current uh, master's project. And what you see right now is just a little uh, pirated image of a makeshift property office selling uh, land outside New Delhi on the on the on highways of New Delhi. But what I'm trying to propose is what if saline land was sold not for cheap prices, but for free and not just to the government, but to everyone. Can a conglomeration of different individuals ranging from Architects, developers, farmers, scientists, and software engineers come together, buy a piece of land for free, and work on it, work on it to make it productive, work on it to develop it in ways that are not necessarily, um, uh, in ways that are not necessarily contested, in ways that are more inclusive and not exclusive. Um, thank you very much. Um, that, was, that was me. Thanks, Anaita. That was really fascinating as um, I think thinking of salt as a material register to talk about so many different issues, whether it's about landscape, about politics. Um, which of our critics would like to start feedback? I just, I just wanted to say like at the end that this is a project that is in progress and it's my current project. So I hope that that kind of, and that's why uh, it's it's right now in, in a stage of research and, and, and making that, that kind of proposal, that proposal that will, that will um, indicate things and 
start to move things. But it's in progress. That's all important. I'm only not commenting because uh, the other Hindi name is Hindi. I'm Bengali. Because I don't know much Hindi. I'm Bengali. <laughs> But um, maybe I should. I can't speak much. But. Uh, so uh, I was going to leave some space okay. for somebody who could speak Hindi properly first. Rashid, did you want to? I can try. 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 I speak English. I grew up in Mumbai. सब लोग नो बड़ी टॉक्स प्रॉपर्ली नहीं हिंदी इन बॉम्बे हिंदी भी थोड़ी हट हट के से है तो एंड दैट्स व्हाई माय हिंदी इज अ बिट डिफरेंट एज़ वेल थैंक यू अनाइता आई वाज क्राइंग बिकॉज़ ऑफ कोविड आई कुडंट गो टू इंडिया फॉर फोर इयर्स स्टिल आई एम सो इमोशनल थैंक यू सी व्हाट आई हैव गॉट आई हैव गॉट सॉल्ट फ्रॉम कच Or, um, I went to Kutch four years ago. Uh, It's so beautiful. Uh, We stayed there for a week. Your project uh, about salt. It's 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 very like country. And I feel that my country is with me. in culture salt is very important and i was thinking when is karwa chok when my mother fasts hamesha khati hai to wo pura khana she always eat food she doesn't stop eating she doesn't give up the whole food but she gives up salt so she eats food without salt mujhe aise lag raha hai ki Um, so i just feel i mean in our culture salt is so important i wanted to say that initially uh, thank you and the way you have linked it with politics land landscape i thoroughly enjoyed it and i'm thinking when i was in kutch matlab seasons बहुत इम्पोर्टेंट है तो शायद तुम द सीजंस वर वेरी इम्पोर्टेंट सो प्रोबेबली यू कैन यू कैन थिंक अबाउट इट एक एक साल में फर्स्ट कैसे चेंज हो इन वन ईयर हाउ कैन लैंडस्केप चेंज और उसके बिकॉज़ ऑफ दैट और तुम आर्किटेक्ट के तुम कैसे रिस्पोंड एंड यू architect and you as an architect how can you respond to that ki tumhara landscape hamesha change karne hoga salt ke ke wajah se because your landscape will keep on changing us is context mein kaise respond kar sakte ho to so how will you respond to that so for my mind the time is very important and it's enough for time for time being shukriya thank you thank you that was really good like um i'm not an architect but i'm just going to my i'm, I'm from south india i'm stuti by the way and um yeah my um hindi is not very good so i'm not i mean it's it's a shame that we all have to say this but we all spoke english in school and uh, studying in india but it's just um uh, i'm trying to improve uh but i thought um Pooja, you just spoke so well. Like I'm impressed with how you just sort of um, presented your feedback. I'm, I, I would, I wouldn't even try now. Uh, but quickly to say, um, I think that salt, as an example, that how you've mentioned, it's just not in sort of Indian culture. Like I'm married to a German, and when we, um, even they have a very similar culture, sort of um, similar uh, uh, cross. Um, i don't know how you say this like you know cross culture um practices so uh, when you enter a new house uh, the first thing they gave me when i um uh, moved into a new house was salt 
like that's like salt and bread. You could give sugar and bread, but they give salt and bread as a welcoming or when you're moving to a new um, house or a new studio space or anything. And I thought that's uh, an interesting practice in different cultures as well. It's good to look at it. And what I liked about your project is also like, you know, um, salt as a political um, uh, intervention, but um, how you can enhance what is there, like, I'm not an architect, but I know architects sort of uh, want to change the existing environment, but rather like what what is there, what is existing? How can you sort of enhance that? Uh, I think if you can, I, I was looking at uh, Robert Ventura's um, learnings from Las Vegas. So he's just looking at what is there in the environment, like the symbols, the signs, and sort of enhancing the same area or the space uh, rather than having to change it politically. I think that sort of theory, um, maybe it might help. I don't know. Um, I, I, I'm looking at it more from a graphic design perspective. So I came across this Robert Ventura's uh, learnings from Las Vegas. And I thought um, the, it's postmodernism, but it also enhances what is there rather than trying to change uh, the whole space. But maybe if you can look at it from that angle as well, rather than having to completely change it, what are the things that you can do to enhance it? Um, that's all I would say. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, that was what I was thinking of as an approach as well, an approach that is not really opposing, so to speak, yeah. but really working with the conditions that exist. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, hi, Anahita. Hi. I really enjoyed your presentation, and I think it's such an important topic uh, to research. Um, I know that we have in the UAE, and specifically around the Arabian Peninsula, we have they're, they're called sabkhas. Yes. And sabkhas yes. are are particular, and within sabkhas we have something called a catch, and it sounds mm -hmm. like kuch. So I feel like mm -hmm. a lot of this kind of uh, l linguistic pollination between the different cultures. Or, or Dubai wala sabdi Hindi jante. So it's kind of amazing that everybody in Dubai... Everybody in uh, Dubai knows Hindi. Almost so native. If you're from Dubai, you must speak Hindi and you must understand Hindi. And uh, I, I remember uh, my mom or dad would get upset if I don't learn my Hindi. So it's very interesting just this whole notion of, of, uh, of language and traditions and ecological permeating almost inter, intercontinentally or between different countries. I find that to be such an important topic. And in the Venice Biennale this year, the UAE Pavilion is dedicating a lot of research around wetlands and ecology around wetlands, which salt lakes and, and uh, salt specifically as a material is well researched. So I think it's a very important... I was sorry, I was just saying that I read an article about salt being used as a building material. Is that the same in the Biennale? Or? Yeah, so they're trying to, uh, in part, they're looking at the ecological footprint of salt lakes and, um, uh, and wetlands, which apparently sequest more carbon than the rainforest. Mm -hmm. It's a very important ecological uh, part of our, of our broader ecological order but also they were looking at experimenting with materials such as salt for temporary structures so i just wanted to comment and say that this is such an important topic and salt is really undermined within the field of architecture and urbanism and i think it's very important that there should be emphasis around that so i just wanted to say thank that thank you i i actually had a question for you um and i, I I think the topic that you raised is is uh, certainly an interesting one from an ecological standpoint, from a political standpoint, from an economic standpoint. What scale do you anticipate your intervention or what do you see as the next sort of steps in your process? Are you looking at, at a very kind of grassroots um, scale that eventually proliferates um, and grows from there? Are you looking at it at a sort of at an urban scale, at a master planning scale? What are your, your sort of hopes or aspirations for your next steps? 
that's, a, that's an interesting question because well, that's where I'm at right now. But the idea was to look at land management and institution building, and also um, for and, and also like kind of communities of knowledge sharing within the region. I think it's more uh, it's it's a project more of building systems rather than planning. I would say. Okay, but systems of systems of sort of human resources of organization of um yeah not not planning but overlaps and and commonalities and kind of aligned aspirations is that fair yeah yeah, yeah. i mean it, it sounds amazing it doesn't sound very architectural but uh certainly i think architects can play a huge role in it how do you see how do you see your role um in the let's say the leadership of that um, process or an architect's role at large, if I could ask that. It, it, I think um, I think for me, at least, I want to start understanding architecture as a collaborative um, profession. Mm -hmm. All in all, there are times when we think of architecture as this one kind of sole architect. But for me now, I'm kind of as I'm doing my masters, I'm trying to think of it, or at least trying my best to think of it as a collaborative profession, where various uh, interdisciplinary um, fields can come together, and an architecture is one of them, and it's not the only one, so to speak. And then that can kind of assist me in, as you mentioned, kind of creating systems of organization. Sure. I guess my question then is how are, how is that different than from say political science or from community organization or from what is what are the skills that you have or that we have as architects that um, and again not uh, I'm curious about it because I do think there's tremendous potential and and our ability as architects who architects have to collaborate just by nature they're they are people who make things or design things but don't make them themselves so it, inherently it is collaborative but what are the skills that an, that you see an architect having that would would lead to this process as opposed to somebody who studied more specifically these kind of economic environmental communal political issues I might jump in because Sam, I think, um, can I call you Sam? Samuel, sorry. Of course. No, no. <laughs> Rashid is coming to us from a salt mine, by the way. What's that? Rashid is coming to us from a salt mine. That's, that's a salt <laughs> mine on his, his right hand side. <laughs> um, sorry. I think what you, what you describe is um, a sort of professional angst that, um, that is kind of widespread and it seems like um, I know this project kind of places itself in that center. I see how you're trying to, as an architect, you have a certain insight into the spatial social consequences of um, something that is territorial and land-based. And so while it's not necessarily about giving direct form to built environment, um, I can see how your architectural skills of um, complex coordination, complex understanding um, would be the skills that would operate here. It's less about visible sort of visual design, um, unless you want to complement it with, as Kuthi suggested, some kind of um, optic or graphic um, campaign of some kind, which you certainly could. Um, but again, arguably that would encroach onto the the role of graphic designers or possibly folk artists, you know, any, anything else that you want to corral into that. But as an architect, I think um, recognizing, I'm so sorry not to do this in Hindi. I'm going to go and castigate myself for, anyway, I could do it in Bangla. Um, um, I think the thing that you're grappling with, allow yourself to grapple with it. Allow yourself to acknowledge that this is, the question that I'm dealing with. What is my role as an architect? How do I best use my skills to talk about this kind of large scale problem, as Pooja pointed out, a problem of temporality, a problem of like the temporality of geological erosion 
as much as the temporality of having to convince the government that you need to let me do this, you need to let me sell land for one rupee token price, because this is going to cause, and with this government, only economic growth. That's going to be your sort of, um, well, that these are, so once you've acknowledged that, okay, my role is coordinating all this complex shit and it's not about, sorry, it's not about like building a building. I mean, I don't want to close doors off to you. You can look into salt crystals and find forms if you want to, but I don't think that's what you're interested in doing. So if you accept your role as this kind of coordinator who's able to <clears throat> synthesize complex problems and talk about the social and spatial impact of things, then um, I think once you allow yourself to do that, then you can think about kind of operations of time and operations of money. What's going to be the economic conviction? What's going to be the environmental conviction? What's going to be the, um, you know, optic, graphic, hearts and minds kind of um, operation? And now, which one of those do you want to turn the volume up on? Which one of those has the largest social spatial consequence? Um, I think elaborating the project in this way, and I, I would say partly following on from Samuel's response, allowing yourself to operate in this way strategically would be good. Like there isn't gonna, there isn't a neat sort of, yes, this is how an architect should behave. It's a case of you deciding which, where, where you want to turn the volume up. Thank Sorry, you. I, I just wanted to follow that up with, I, I think I agree with that. And I think that that part of it, the, the graphic, the formal, whatever the visual parts of what an architect does are the least interesting part of this particular problem. I think all of the other things, Shumi, that you just outlined, that's where the interesting part lies, even though that's maybe outside of the traditional role of, of what we do. That's why I was curious what your, what your thoughts were or if you'd formulated them yet. Thank you. That's Can I come to you quickly before we move to the next student? I just wanted to say something as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hey, um, hi, Anita. Um, I'm happy to uh, look at uh, this project uh, and the associations you have built around it. Um, for me, um, I studied geology a long time back, and I always saw soil as an ecosystem uh, by itself, uh, part organic matter, part inorganic. Um, it's uh, for me. My only one question um, is that. You spoke about um, the land use and the control of land use um, through soil in some way, or the effect that uh, the soil has over land use. Um, do you know of any, I read up an article quite some time back, Down to Earth magazine about uh, the Indian uh, forest department, um, you know, looking at reworking the, the topography of that area by plantation. Um, and there are certain plants were planted, and something called Kando a long time back in Gujarati. Um, but uh, it's interesting to see that there are larger ramifications of uh, you know natural systems and ecosystems available, and humans have been uh, intervening at various levels. Um, I often often feel that architects, um, you know, theoretically we, we we think we can do everything, but eventually, very often matters out of our hands. Um, it's also larger uh, political practices, uh, economic practices, or uh, you know, forces rather that actually uh, impact uh, nature of uh, urban development. So, I'm just wondering if you knew of any such uh, you know impacts or positive directions uh, you've seen in your research. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I. I think I need to. I would. I would love to read that article. What you just you just mentioned, but um, there are certain regenerative projects, uh, a, a kind of ecological regenerative projects that are happening. Um, but to me, this is just uh, something that comes on the back of my mind because I just visited recently Oroville, and I'm, I don't want to like put it out there and cause a stir or. <laughs> But Oroville as a, as, as a kind of a condition is also quite interesting as an ecological regenerative and land use project where um, I'm not really talking about the spiritual aspects of it, but just the kind of uh, more technical aspects 
of how they kind of came onto a, a land that was barren and converting it into like a forest. So yes, there are. This is this is one that really comes off um, on my mind right now. I'm sure there are many in India, um, but that's a, that's an interesting kind of a case study, I suppose. Great. Well, thank you everyone for really rich and amazing feedback. Um, I think, and thank you, Anaita, for a great presentation. There's some great comments in the chat as well, so check those yeah. out. And, um, and now we'll move to the next student, Apoorv, who um, will be presenting his project from Sustainable Environmental Design, the MArch program, and it's called Revisiting Hotels, a Holistic Approach to Increase Guest Comfort and Save Energy. Hi. So I'll just get started. Namaste. Hello, my name is Apoorva, and I'm going to present a project to you today which is a hotel rest house based on the principles of adaptive thermal comfort situated in the capital region of India. First of all, we'll discuss Delhi's weather. Due to high extreme levels of pollution, there happens to be drastic temperature changes in Delhi's weather between the summers and winters. In Delhi's NCR, it's worth paying attention to the daily dry bulb and wet bulb temperature differences, which gives us an opportunity to make it cooler with water. Besides this, it has also been seen that there is a greater than 10 degree difference between day and night temperature. This way in summers, we can also utilize the lower night temperatures to cool the inner room during the day. The hotel's tenure plays an important role in the thermal comfort. When we see the daily tenure of the hotels in Delhi, we notice that at least 70% of the hotel rooms are vacant during the day. This gives us an easy opportunity to run these rooms without air conditioning, since anyway, these rooms are used during only the night. The remaining 30% of the rooms can be given the option to utilize diffusion cooling. Now we come to actual construction site. The, the construction site, Gorgon City is located in an ideal dense urban environment. This construction site is connected to several tourist and business locations via nearby metro station and it is surrounded by business and residential areas. A few different hotel projects were situated, studied for the inspiration for this project. Three hotels were studied of which one is Mangar, one is Amsterdam, third hotel is situated in Jodhpur. They, develop, they help develop the strategy which will now be applied for this project. First, the combination of air circulation at night with high heat capacity. Second, evaporative cooling. Third, shedding for the middle areas. Now with identified strategies, we will utilize them in our project one by one for the comfort of guests' rooms. Typical hotel rooms are considered to be completely air conditioned with a gallery in between and rooms with large windows. Construction of the windows are quite standard in which there is only a brick wall and single glass windows. Its benefit is that it provides comfort to all kinds of guests. On the other hand, it is expensive. It becomes a reason for pollution, lean towards high carbon emission and the guests spend their time in closed rooms without any interaction. For this reason, firstly, we will reform the exterior coating of the structure. By installing heat resistant and double layered windows, we achieve comfort for about half a year. This technique makes the energy usage zero, but it is not comfortable at all time. Second stage is shedding. This is why to prevent the upper sun rays, overhangs are connected in front of the rooms. Due to the shade obtained by this, rooms are free from solar growth from all direction. Let's now move forward. By opening windows in the night, the annual comfort hours are increased by 10% right away. This makes the day a lot cooler, but there's still room 
for improvement. Through stimulation, the window shapes are customized. Sliding and folding doors are utilized to get maximum open areas. In the next stage with air circulation at night, higher heat resistant construction materials are used. This helps to obtain similar temperature inside. Next, by using shower towers, cooling is achieved through evaporation and air is circulated via solar chimney. With this strategy, during summer days, rooms are cooled easily, but there is still a problem for extreme summer days. With this, we come back to discussion about 70% of the rooms being vacant during the day. Now we make the choice of air conditioning for the guest in every two out of five rooms. This also looks after the guest who have a lower comfort threshold. The next strategy is to reduce utilization of energy inside rooms in the evening by offering interesting areas outside the rooms of the guests and promoting external use. The utilization of air conditioning can be reduced even further. Control jowlies, water sprinkles and fans are used to boost the comfort threshold. Productive of the structure. On an especially hot day when the temperature rises a lot, the guests has various options to spend their time. By choosing any one of these four options, any guest can attain comfort at any time. These numbers can be explained in a better way by structure, proper description. At 7 a.m., the guest is either sleeping or eating in both types of room. Due to the cooling provided over the previous night, the guest can open their windows and be comfortable. Or, or else to increase external comfort, they can enjoy their mornings by experiencing the comfortable temperature in their balcony outside their room due to the measure taken. At this time, the rooms without the air conditioning are vacant in the afternoons. Guests only relax by staying in air conditioned rooms. During the evenings, the guests are mostly returning back to the hotels after roaming outside or after conducting their business. At this time, Guests are encouraged to spend their time outside their room. They can enjoy views from their balconies or they can explore the other areas of the hotel where comfort is being provided by shades and other various methods. Late at night, it's difficult to open the windows and sit inside the rooms when the air outside is still a little hot due to the heat from the day. Thus, evaporating cooling is used at this time. Furthermore, the guests can chit-chat while sitting in the balcony where the temperature is still in the comfort zone. Now, the dis discussion until now will be translated in architectural terms. Firstly, we start by constructing two multi-storied building blocks opposite each other. This way, we make a central courtyard which can be used for landscaping and to encourage various facilities. This courtyard will provide a view to guests that a city cannot accomplish. A large number of sections are removed from the southern buildings so that the, during winter the sunlight can reach the top of the northern buildings in the morning itself. It gives comfort in winter. However, in the summers, these are covered with mesh doors. Based on sun and the wind direction, shower towers and solar ducts are installed on it. The shower towers located is decided based on the direction on the wind. And their heights are so high that they can catch the wind at a rapid pace. This air is distributed in the rooms through the air delivery equipment, which is located in the basement. Due to the heat of the sun, the solar duct creates a difference in air pressure by which the hot air from the rooms are squeezed out and the use of ventilator fans are reduced. The duct heights are specified in such a way that maximum sunlight falls on its surface so that more and more pressure is created due to the heat. Some places of the building are vacated so that sunlight falls on the solar ducts all the time. Two separate blocks of the rooms are included in which different hotel tasks are situated. A block of rooms is again hollowed out on the ground floor so that air can pass through it. This also reduces the footprint of the building. These empty spaces are used for cafes or exhibitions. 
Water areas are also provided in these places on which the air passes over it, helping to raise the level of comfort further. All programs and services located in this building are described. The swimming pool is located in the open space between the guest section. In this project, the effect of wind speed and the direction has been understood using computerized fluid dynamics, which has the fixed height of the roofs. It is seen from this that in the central courtyard, cold air comes from the water bodies located on the ground floor. Air also flows over the roof, which is cooled down by the swimming pool located in the center of the guest area. Now we come to the exterior design of the building so that we can achieve more inner comfort. There are a total of four prime phases in this project. Using lattices, lattice of stones in the control manner, different shapes have been studied with the aim that these shapes create shadows on themselves, but they do not increase their surface area to allow rise in the solar growth. By doing this, it was seen that the horizontal shape works best on the southern, southeastern face. This 30 to 60 degree angle reduces solar growth by 13.3 per square meter in comparison to a flatter face. Likewise, standing shapes on the northwestern face achieve success. 30 to 60 degree shapes reduce solar radiation by 12.2. This gives rise to two kinds of fronts, the sliding lattice on the southern front and the revolving stone mesh door on the northwestern front. At this door is controlled, the guests can optimize it to suit their comfort. Now we discuss how we will achieve, achieve comfort in exterior spaces. Beside the balcony, the terrace and the courtyard are open spaces where guests can spend their time. A microclimate study of the outskirts shows us that only during the summer when the sun is high, UTC1 or the temperature experience in these places is above the comfort level. Additional strategies such as shade over the roofs and dense plantations in the central courtyard acts like a small forest is proposed. The greenery not only provides comfort, but it also provides views from any area of this building. When this project is compared to any general hotel, energy is used by 53%. It matches the level of sustainable buildings reported by the Indian Department of Energy Efficiency. With the solar energy, it saves about 1 crore 37 lakh annually. And finally, some pictures. The, the jalis and the backyard uh, below the rooms, the swimming pool and the front of the building. Thank you. Thanks so much, Apur. That was a really, uh, very comprehensive and terrific presentation and excellently um, translated as well. And all these complex concepts to try and express them in Hindi is no small feat. Um, from our critics, who would like to start to, to give Apur feedback? Thank you, Apur. Um, aapka presentation, but um, you research. You have done so much research. Well done. Sorry. And well done. I want to think in Hindi. I want to ask you, what is your aspiration? What do you want to do? Your presentation is very technical, very good. But I, I feel very happy. Who is going to live there? Why did you choose this style? I want, I, I want this story. Why do you want to do this? I want to hear this. I want some drama. Okay, I'll give you drama. This was my dissertation. You made a dissertation part of sustainable This is part of my dissertation. I'm doing my master's. I chose this site 
हाईली डेंस अर्बन एनवायरमेंट इट कुड डिपिक डेथ एंड दिस टाइप इन दिस टाइप ऑफ क्लाइमेट वेयर where the summer is there because of the weather and then where the summer is very hot in this type and if if you talk about a hotel or if you talk about a house or an office where and the comfort comes first there and this type of buildings and give you so much challenges comfort level because there are all type of guests there some are very strict about their comfort level and that's why i've chose this kind of site presentation compared to others because uh, like uh, is more technical so yeah थैंक यू अभी समझ में आ रहा है और और नाउ आई अंडरस्टैंड यू हम इससे क्या सीख सीख सकते हैं कि ये व्हाट कैन वी लर्न फ्रॉम हियर दैट योर प्रोजेक्ट कैन बी अप्लाई टू अदर अदर हाउसेस इफ यू कीप इंडियन इंडस्ट्री इन माइंड आई वोंट से इंडिया बट इन ऑल ओवर द वर्ल्ड ग्लोबली सस्टेनेबल डिजाइनिंग is on a stage now we designed something and we said wow i need so much light in my room and they will look into that but we don't realize that that with that much light there is so much heat coming in there as well okay. so, yeah, it's a, it's a new concept that we'll do this but in summer is is air cooling and we try to follow the same language in india let's talk about north india or central india in the environment the hot environment because you can't follow that so then then you try to follow sustainable environment like उटेंट होटल्स की ऑक्यूपेंसी बहुत मैटर करती है एंड एंड होटल्स ऑक्यूपेंसी मैटर्स अ लॉट और प्रोजेक्ट्स में सो इन ऑल द प्रोजेक्ट्स राइट अ अपर थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर द प्रेजेंटेशन थैंक यू रशन वेरी इट वाज वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग um humbi i will attempt to speak in him so everybody can laugh as well but <laughs> okay aapke jante dubai mein come look bahut garam hai you know dubai is a very hot place sustainability ka fikr and then thought of sustainability aur ye fikr ke sustainability ka fikr and this thought of sustainability the, the developers talk about it and they try to achieve it but ye fikr sustainability ka fikr india is also thinking about the sustainability or sustainability ke baad it's not the same it's 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 not the same it's wo dono bhi compare kar sakte and you can compare the both to use traditional ways of building um so i wanted to hear your thoughts about Uh, so i wanted to i'm just trying to convert between the hindi and <laughs> so i uh, i mean the the point that i'm trying to make is uh, and maybe sam uh, sam has a lot of experience about building traditionally versus i mean building ecologically versus ye fikr sustainability ke fikr hai i wanted to hear your comments about this okay, so firstly like um um uh 
so like this project uh, ye project uh, uh, climate it talks more about the climate i mean it, it doesn't talk about the material per se you know like mm. uh, because uh, like hamara ek principle hai hum jo hame jo sikhaye gaye sustainable oh. environmental design mein we have a principle and what we've been taught about the sustainability uh, environment agar aap kyunki buildings zyada tar urja matlab they consume a lot of energy buildings consume a lot of energy industries nahi वॉटर तरीके हैं the vernacular architecture which we can use jo with vernacular with architecture and which we can use the sustainability uh, environment mein kaam nahi karenge because so in the, this environment it won't work ko bhi ke bare mein bhi sochna padega and have you have to think about the life ha bahut acche principles hain lekin unko tarika hai they are good principles but there are ways to do it ram ghar ki baat karte hain like we talk about ram ghar they can be used in a better way not just in a basic way it's magar, it's very much possible magar aapke fikr kya in aapke fikr comparison mein but your uh, thinking uh, abhi abhi in comparison india or uae sub global south ke matlab mein in in india and uae is all they all the countries of global south traditional ways taklidi ne aapke banate taklid ke sath or traditional the, patar ke sath aur aisa that you make with traditional ways with traditional I stones to be more accessible than ye gharb ke fikr ne more sustainable ecological but of course i mean as cities develop you have to uh, i wanted to hear your thoughts actually on being in india thinking about the very the the, the difference between ecological and sustainable and is that something that you're thinking about um the way i see it um inspiration comes from uh tradition oh. but uh, the design has to respond to today's uh technology mm. so jaise ki is project mein maine jali ka istemal kiya like in this project i use jalis uh, middle east mein india mein jali is common in middle east in india and very old concept and how to prove it in a new ways and to use it in the modern technology because our ways of living is not the same as it was before technology it depend on the technology and our life is going very fast life before was very slow uh, before they used to make their own home you can't do much apart from that i am able to uh, answer like what you it's a very to... very interesting presentation thank you Apo. sorry it's a very interesting presentation thank you you are welcome thank you Hey, Apul. Hi, Paul. Um, Hi. Thank you for the detailed, uh, almost technical, uh, resolved uh, presentation. Uh, just a few uh, thoughts and comments. Um, so the first thing was, um, uh, in my understanding, um, if you've chosen a commercial project, um, you know, for um, adding these layers of sustainable uh, layers of sustainability, yeah. and uh, um, 
for me it's always interesting to understand that uh, sustainability begins at the core questions um like for example uh the height of a building the massing of a building the scale of a building the density of development the materials chosen and then the impact the climatic uh, uh, you know how it responds to climate in some way or almost integrates with climate uh, my question to you was more about the brief you probably built for yourself um in the sense that were was there a, was there ever a, a thought that uh because of the commercial aspect to it there's a very strong um i would say expectation on the performance of that space uh yeah a performance uh um, which comes to the point of users and usability so uh, we often talk about usability in product design website design but um, one of the things that attract um users to uh you know contemporary hotels is that uh, they have a a history of background and expectation of that space and and if you change those parameters for example um it will impact uh, you know users um i would say uh, i would uh, users actually using or trying to use that space so in general the question was uh, was there a discussion with people in the hotel industry uh, to understand is there a, is a re- is, is a brief possibly real um second question was um let me uh, come to that uh, was that when you spoke about sustainable design being in a nascent stage in india um i know you spoke about vernacular subsequently but um, i think traditionally we have been extremely strong on how our buildings responded to climate um so uh, but yes i understand your uh, premise where contemporary uh, character or contemporary nature of building in india has somehow you know uh, gone back in those uh, reviewing or relooking at the same principles uh, so in that sense i i found it uh, you know valid but i was just only concerned about uh, like like why not for example only a ground plus one structure i mean why a high rise you know there's so many factors which actually define so you you you, you pretty decide it's going to be a high rise and you find ways to you know you manage it uh, sustainably so it was uh, Great, thank you. All right. Um, so, uh, um, like, um, well, the choice of project was up to us. Like, uh, I'm from Delhi, and uh, we were quite, we were like uh, motivated to pick projects for um, the context we are aware of. So it, uh, that's how the decision of the uh, site was, uh, and uh, like the, ch- the challenge given to us was to. take real world problems and yes it is a very it, it can be adapted to a real, real project because it's based on research i mean it's based on a lot of uh, not it's not shown in this presentation but it's based on uh, uh, surveys it's like how users respond to a particular space what what they would prefer like i can say if you go to a hotel you would like to sit in your room watch the tv but uh, when i conducted the research yes people would like to do that but if uh given the opportunity they would rather spend their time outside because they're anyway sitting at their home and doing the same thing so uh, uh like for example in this project outdoor energy use outdoor uh, use was promoted so guests spend their time outside rather than uh using their conditioning inside so uh, uh these projects in sustainability are in in our program are based on real world uh problems and we aim to at least uh, make them as realistic as possible but of course with the academic limitations some things might like for example uh uh, uh i mean I, uh, if you talk about pollution it's a man made issue and we assume that uh, with the with the uh, steps taken by the government they will be resolved in the near future and these buildings uh, will eventually contribute uh uh to a cleaner environment considering they using so so less energy so that that's it yeah i think it's a general comment that um it would help students and you guys are at february you've got months ahead of you um and yet it would help you at this stage to be able to say exactly how you understand the problem as it faces you because much of what you've said there approve no challenge absolutely sure it's based on research 
um, there's there's no um, no challenge there. I think I'm a little unsure as to what you consider the challenge to be at this point, because um, with heating and cooling of buildings, I think we know the numbers tell us what to do. Um, the reasons why we don't do them are other, right? They're to do with um, cultural sort of aspirations, as has been mentioned in the chat. And um, <clears throat> yeah, other mechanisms as to why buildings don't look the way they should, work the way they should, and why we don't use them the way we should. Um, so all of this is to say that there is, we know that there's a disconnect between what research says we should do and how we live. Yeah. And I think in your presentation, we were getting convinced by the stuff that is not in question. Like the research shows us, yeah, okay. How are you gonna make that happen though? And I think that's, that's the part where I want to know what your thinking is because continuing to say, yes, the research will provide these changes. There's no argument. I totally agree with you. And maybe it's a case of visualizing and making that all the more urgent as part of your project, fine. But I think we also have to look at the, the other side of the coin as, as to why this isn't happening. And so I think, you know, for instance, you were talking about Jali, which, you know what, a lot of Western people in a lot of architecture schools will know the word Jali because it's seductive, because it's really beautiful. And that's why, that's what seduces first. It's not because, oh, Jali, the thing that reduces environmental performance. Nobody's talking about it like that. Neither are they saying, oh, Jali, the thing that keeps women impressed and looking out but not being able to be seen. Nobody talks it like, about like that either. It's usually recognized because of its visual and seductive qualities and, and that register. Oh, how nice. It looks traditional now. There's a concrete building, they put some jolly on it. That's cute. No? But that's, even though that might not be the way you want to work, it needs acknowledging so that you can critically work, you know, acknowledging it. So I think, I don't want to speak for all the critics, but I think that was the reality that was actually excluded from your presentation yeah, um, no. It's like the elephant in the room. It's like everybody knows we want big shiny glass buildings because those people over there have big shiny buildings. Everybody knows we shouldn't have them because they're just stupid, but they happen anyway. So there's a sort of little part that needed to be acknowledged, I think. No? I, I, um, th that's a really interesting thing to say because uh, uh, <laughs> it just made me realize for the past one and a half years when I, while I've been studying here, I haven't talked about it. I haven't talked about uh, selling it. I mean, the selling point for us became the climate. It wasn't about the Jollies looking beautiful because the Jollies actually are- They don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> we should. If, we should I, really care. Get, no argument there. If I give you statistics that how much money you'll end up saving because of using that, you might care, right? And that was, the, uh, that was the, the last slide was about that. You, you're saving like 1.4. Now that might be cynical as hell, but it is one strategy. There, there are others that you might explore as an architect, but. Uh, probably uh, I couldn't send this to my uh, reviewers and they would have graded me uh, badly because it, I need to talk about numbers in the project. But yeah, I do get your point. And that yeah. is one. I don't like, know about your critics. I mean, just be. I stick to your hardline realism thing. Mate, no one's going to invest in the building because in 500 years, it's going to have ameliorated something. Okay, let me be realistic. 70 years, it will have ameliorated something. Your investors don't care. Your investors want their money back within the next 10 years. So you need to sell it to them too, as well as the community for whom you can say, yes, 70 years, 200 years down the line, this building is going to be what you want. You also need to sell it to the investors. So if anyone's trying to tell you that that's, you know, it's dirty to talk about such things. It's not. It's how the building would get made. If you don't talk about it, it won't happen. Of course, it's not dirty to talk about. It's like something that I've kind of been unconditioned to talk, to talk about. Right, right. It's, 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 it's not a bad thing. It's, yeah, I'm telling you, yeah, you just open my eyes that we need to talk that, about that again. And uh, yeah. Um. Have, yeah, I'm sure you can also find some fun in doing that. Of course. <laughs> Yeah, of course. 
We're running a bit behind time, but I wanted to make sure that Sam and Stuti that you got a chance to to also contribute before we move to the next. Topic. I think everyone would be um, waiting to hear from Sam. I'd, I'd rather pass on <laughs> uh, <laughs> to Sam for now, and I'll, I'll give a very simple thing later on, and that's it. No, I I mean we've we've done a project very similar to this that has these aspirations, and we were we were fortunate enough to have a client who who just kind of jumped on board and, and was really excited and enthusiastic. But I recognize now, you know, seven years on that um, the second client who wants those things isn't, isn't ready to pay for them or the third or the fourth. So things that, that Shumi was speaking about absolutely resonate and make sense. It's not, um, nobody's going to come come to it for the for the beauty of, of the jolly. It's It's got to make, you you really have to look at it holistically and I think too much in the same way that that Anahita was was speaking about it from a, from a very macro kind of scale yes you can take one project and look at it in in isolation and resolve it technically to the best of all of the conditions that, that present themselves at that site how um, you know again the environment at that site the politics at that site the social construct at that site the demands of the program and the developer and all of those kinds of things but i think if you take a step back and then look at how does how does this approach um, again as shimmy was saying how does this approach how can this be applied at, at a larger scale with greater success because it's not um, there won't be a sh necessarily a shortage of clients who aspire to have these things, but you will find a lot of people who are unwilling to pay for it or doesn't fit in there in some other constraint that they have. Um, I, I did want to ask, um, sorry, that was my kind of monologue, but I did want to ask, um, you'd mentioned at one point that, that the project talks about environment, but not materials. And I wanted to ask you specifically how, you're able to separate those two because I, I don't think you can practically or especially technically. Okay, um, uh, I'll explain it this way. I, I said the project talks about climate, uh, not the environment. Like uh, it's more about how your design is based on the climate outside uh, or the weather conditions. And uh, because how um, uh, the climate governs the building use. I mean, for example, uh, like this no. project is, sorry? No, climate does, not, the climate does not govern the use of a building. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, then maybe I'll just, I'll, give you, I'll try to explain it in, in some other way then. Um, the way you use a building is very much governed how, uh, by what the climate is what the climate is in India and what the climate is it, it's in London, you design the buildings according to that. Uh, yeah. So those are different things. All right. Um, so uh, coming like when, when I'm talking, when this project is not talking about the materiality, what I meant was I'm not talking about the, the, the carbon footprint. I'm not talking about uh, using sustainable material as, as say, for example, vernacular materials, maybe stone, maybe earth. Uh, I'm not talking about them in depth. I mean, I can't talk about uh, where I'm getting them from, how, uh, how much it is costing me to get it to the site. Uh, is it imported? Am I using Italian stone? Am I using uh, local quota stone? I'm not talking about these things in this particular project because this project does not focus on the carbon uh, footprint of the building, but it focuses on the environmental design, how uh, that how um, adaptive, like the first uh, line I said, well, it's based on adaptive thermal comfort, like what I said in Hindi. Uh, so, sure. But yeah. I guess my only point is that if you put in a gypsum board false ceiling, as yeah. opposed to exposing the thermal mass of, let's say, a vaulted roof in stone or concrete or whatever it is, that'll change yes, it will. the performance of the thing. Yes. If you lay down yeah. carpet over a concrete slab, that will change the thermal yeah, comfort. Yeah, the thermal, yeah. So in that sense, materiality in my view, is inseparable. I understand if you don't want to talk about it in terms of carbon footprint. Yeah, in terms want to of carbon, yeah. I mean, social agree. implications, color, texture, all of those things. 
but it, uh, in my view, they're inseparable. So I would encourage you to, to sort of jump one step further back and look at it a little bit more holistically. Uh, you're right about that. And uh, uh, that those aspects have been included in that in this project, like the use of uh, rammed earth, the use of exposed concrete flooring, even vaulted ceilings. Uh, again, uh, I haven't shown them. I haven't shown them in this project, but they yeah they are a part of the complete project because of the time limit. Uh, but I uh, totally get what you're saying, and you're not wrong. And you're absolutely right there. And uh, those things do matter, of course. But in this project, I haven't talked about the carbon uh, footprint of the material. That's what I would say. It's just the tragedy of the, not your project, but the tragedy of the potential project is that one designs something that makes total sense on paper, you know, in terms of its thermal performance, in terms of how it would be used, all of that, and it's still not wanted. So I think all of us have a sort of fear that that might be possible if one continues to look only at the thermal performance as the way of governing and finding form, presenting the building, what have you, because I don't think there's any argument as to what you're trying to do with the project. It's, it's just a fear of you could put all of that into it and it still could just fall completely flat. Um, and so I think we're all just mild fearful, but it's, it's February. You have time to add all the sort of sex appeal into it that would be really the only thing that makes a hotel be constructed in Delhi because there are lots of hotels in Delhi already. And so if someone's going to put a, if someone's going to plant a new one, um, they believe that there's money to be made from it. So you need to convince them somehow, whatever the seduction is, you know, maybe you want to market it as, you know, the most comfortable building you've ever been in. Do it. Yeah, I think it's um, a little bit simple, like, you know, I'm going to take it from a graphic design angle, probably, if you were going to uh, promote this project, and then um, you came to me to make a book out of this uh, project, and then how, if I told you that I'm not going to use the recycled paper, because, or I'm not going to use a particular material um, to make it sustainable because it's not about that just wouldn't make sense I think to you like you know it is it, it, like for me it's um, like Sam said that the, they're, they're two not separate things because as an outsider I'm not an architect even for me it doesn't make sense so um, it would really help to combine these two together um, to say what you're saying probably which would help because it's not a bad thing to combine the sustainability angle with the materials have you spoken to um the old and like you know the old uh, people in india like the grandmoms or you know um are there any projects that have been done in south india or because i'm from the south so i would like really urge you to look at different practices maybe or you know like old and vernacular practices but i know you don't want to do that but i guess it would really um, help to talk to as many grandmums as possible. So probably to bring in those little story that uh, Shumi was missing or, uh, or, or um, others who were missing uh, the little story. But yeah, that's what I would say. <laughs> I mean, I think um, it's a really interesting point um, at all the points that I've made, because I guess, especially like fin coming out of like an, the SED program, I think everyone's pushing you to think about how you make this proposal real in terms of who you communicate it to and how best to make your, the idea you developed as a kind of student project into a reality and like what constraints comes with that. So it's, I think it's really useful feedback to think about as you kind of move from the world of academia into the world of practice. Back to the real world. Yeah. <laughs> I, I understand like, uh, uh, you can say like, probably if you look at S any SED, for, uh, SED project, you see the lack of seduction, <laughs> uh, but that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about the technical aspects and uh, that's been uh, our forte, I would say. And, um, uh, uh, so many presenters here would be talking about that. So, uh, like, I'm not, I'm not saying that. Um, uh, like, that's been the focus of the presentation and uh, no, the project in a way. I'd like to refer you if you don't know already, and I feel a bit guilty because I love her as a human being so much. But I think you should, you could look at the work of Anubama Kundu. Um, right. I don't know if you know the work of Anubama Kundu. I've heard, yeah, I do. Too hard. 
you're going to be really happy when you look at her work. Yeah, I was thinking the same. <laughs> <laughs> you're, um, on my bad kare the Anupama ke baare mein. Last yes, week, right? last week I and you were talking about yeah. Anupang. Yeah. Ha ha. Ha. Wait, what? Yeah. Yeah, I'm saying the same. And um, kind of desi, but um, absolutely focused on performance. Um, and yet her work gets described as traditional and vernacular and so on. She uses um, <clears throat> local economy, because um, kind of not unrelated to the previous project. She uses um, local and traditional craftspeople. And yet her research is focused purely on performance. She, <laughs> like I, uh, you know, slightly bristles at the, at the notion of being described as this Indian architect who works with, you know, rural craftspeople. Yes, she does, but it's not about that for her. Um, it could be about that. And I often, I think now the Anu is sort of over, 50, over 50, we sort of talk about the utility of that language and when or not to sort of um, acknowledge it precisely as I'm kind of discussing with you. And I know that when she was a younger woman, she would not have wanted to acknowledge it because she was trying to prove the worth of her research in kind of quite objective terms. But we're not in an either or world. We're in a sort of both and world. And it's taken her some time to sort of figure out how to be comfortable with that. Um, and I guess we're sort of aware of that looking at your work. But for whatever reason, you are um, I don't want to use the word stubborn because I don't think it's a bad thing, but you're sort of rooted in this idea of I'm not talking about left or right. I'm talking about this. Fine. Um, but don't okay. let those things that are not left or right kind of become sort of shadows to your project. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, point was look at Anu's work. You'll like it. If you I can't have... find too much of it, let me know and I can send you. No, I, have, I have seen her work and I really like it. And, um, but I'm also, I would say like, it's not, um, I mean, if you look at Norman Foster's work, uh, you know, like if you talk about a, an architect of that kind, he's also making sustainable designs, even though they don't, they don't look like one. They're very modern build, buildings, very modern buildings. But what, like, here comes the definition of sustainability. Like, there's a general perception about what sustainability is. And then there's sustainability I think uh, even before coming to the A, I had that perception. But after coming to A, uh, actually, it's it's changed for me. Uh, it's not just about uh, using traditional uh, techniques. It's about sometimes going very modern also, and still you achieve that uh, energy performance. You achieve that uh, material use. You hundred percent. That's why uh, in 2012, Anu displayed like some very earthy stuff. But in 2016, she displayed something totally unromantic, these ferro cement boxes. And to her, it's absolutely fine. Stunning. <laughs> um, I'm sorry to cut this short, but I think yeah. we're going to move to the next presenter. But um, I think it's really, it's an important conversation that I hope we pick up later, because actually, um, I think it's also a different kind of linguistic conversation about um, the way other like an external voice perceives certain architecture as vernacular or um you know like as, as Shimi was saying this like kind of earthy romantic romanticized or fetishized way of practicing versus actually recognizing what the work is really about mm -hmm. and how language can play a role in in kind of defining or labeling what that work really is rather than it being pigeonholed into this idea of vernacular or even sustainable because I don't maybe we're not interrogating enough what those words mean but anyway on that note I'm going to move to um, the next student who's Tanuj Kohli from Diploma 7 who's going to be presenting a project called Wasted Boundaries. Namaste everybody. Um, uh, I'm going to show you my presentation. It will be unfortunate in English. I've showed it to my parents in Hindi, but I couldn't do much. So I'm going to do my presentation in English. Um, share screen. Everybody see my screen okay? Yes. Okay. 
Kolkata historically has had a unique relationship with its waste, waste that has defined territories, expropriated lands and bodies, created communities and cultivated ecologies. The East Kolkata wetlands, a 125 square kilometer productive landscape, processes Kolkata's sewage waste through bioremediation and garbage farming, producing 50,000 tons of food a year to feed 75% of Kolkata's population. These wetlands were not always inhabited. Prior to Brit British occupation, salty marshes rendered the land infertile and was locked upon uh, outsiders as home to the savages. The colonizers built sewage systems and canals within the city that directed waste towards these saltwater marshes, dividing the inner white colonial town from the hinterland. In 1929, farmers opened up the sewage pipes to let them flow into the Salian ecology. This was an act of utmost ingenuity that cultivated the land into a productive landscape it is today. Today, however, this dynamic social infrastructure is decreasing in size due to urbanization, which has enveloped and confined the wetlands on all sides. The reading of this anthropocentric ecology starts through the understanding of its multiple invisible infrastructures that buffer and control waste flows from the domestic space of the toilet to the fish ponds. On the ground, however, multiple civic structures such as highways and wasteful canals separate and fracture the relationship between the city and its wetlands. These divisions are only more exacerbated by the juridical boundaries that have divided the water basin into two zones, one of the International Ramsar Conservation and the other of the Kolkata Municipal Corporation. This dichotomy today has led to the toxic labor practices imposed upon the communities who have found themselves stuck within these protocols. Construction of illegal developments within the Ramsar boundary, flooding of the city due to the decrease of wetland area, and managerial conflicts resulting in a toxic landfill. This wetlands oscillating ecology relies heavily on its permeability due to environmental factors such as sea level rise and monsoons. Yet with these strict protocols confining the landscape, the question arises now as to how could these strict boundaries and legislative policies be dismantled to simulate a new interstitial territory mediating between the urban environment and the rural wetland. Could a spatial agent be deployed that can highlight the metabolism between the interactions of the city and its productive landscape rather than its contradictions? To begin addressing these large territorial forces, the project will focus on the perpetually burning Dapa landfill, where the concept of vase unveils its physical duality as a spatial and temporal entity. A vast internal ecology characterizes this waste landscape. It is home to human and animal life that appropriate and traverse through the landfill, exploiting it for their own needs as they continue to modify and reshape this temporal landscape. Waste pickers collectively contribute to recycling up to 25% of the refuse. However, much of the remaining 60% cannot be safely recycled due to the lack of infrastructure. And while the landfill continues to grow by 0.25 meters in height uh, a year, Without proper containment strategies, waste invades and contaminates surrounding fields and berries and bodies with its leachets. Toxicity in the environment and its imposition upon its inhabitants is ever present. However, being an integral part of the area's social infrastructure, the landfill is endured and relied upon, being a life-giving and life-taking force. The architectural project will be positioned along the threshold conditions defined by the colonial canal systems, a juridically ambiguous zone where the territorial forces are intensified. While their lush and peaceful appearance may fool us, what lies behind is symbolic of the paradoxical nature of the conservation area. An area where conflicts in real estate and environmentalism are ever present, resulting in abandoned structures set for demolition. These illegal unfinished, unfinished structures will provide the spatial footprints to create a constellation of social infrastructures around the site. The project calls for the suspension of pre-existing laws within these abandoned areas in order to catalyze the implementation of a new protocol for commons. This framework will act in favor of the marginalized communities offering collective ownership of the dispossessed land and its use. And while the architectural project within this context does not aim to solve the problems of this vast territorial network, the project seeks to work in harmony with the prevailing forces mediating through a series of active buffer zones. By deploying a series of porous and impermeable thresholds along the disused spaces of the canal banks, the intervention will aim to create a soft infrastructure of enclosures across the site. Initiating new spatial relationships containing uh, the toxic forces, 
And also these strategies will give room to ecological processes that require space and time to turn waste from a destructive entity into a productive force. The project will position itself across four exemplary sites in the DAPA area. The sites present four different conditions within which abandoned buildings lay on the convergence of socio-political and environmental forces. The first side of the project is positioned on the terraformed wetland and agricultural area that over the past decade has seen dramatic urbanization. While construction today has been halted by activists, they also demand for the destruction of the illegal development. Rather than contributing to uh, the construction waste, what, uh, what I'm trying to do is bring in pre-existing modes of production onto the site. The area is converted into a park of temporalities where subtle terraforming opens up the land for manipulation. Room is created for water reservoirs and layers of leisure, arts, and petroculture educational laboratories to facilitate the convergence of communities and commuters alike. The second site, located in the northern edge of the Dapa area, utilizes the two sources of sewage water as a mediating agent. By giving room to water and the natural processes of phytoremediation, wetness is brought back to the land, only this time its ownership is given to the prevalent waste management cooperatives to use as spaces for communal gathering and resource exchange and collective equipment. The connections within, uh, within and into the park will be aided by mud walls and boardwalks, utilizing the site's clay deposits and recycled waste from the landfill. These structures will contain various forms of vegetation aiming to spatialize the relationship between human and non-human species. At site three, the key agent to the whole area, the DAPA landfill, will be contained with a threshold deployed as a series of impermeable and porous barriers that mediate the interaction between the subject and the toxic forces of the landfill. The actions of walling, carving, and safely connecting the landscape will give limited yet crucial access to the landfill in a controlled manner. Projecting into the future, the site strategy imagines the death of the landfill as a moment for the birth of public space on top where architecture that once facilitated access for rack picking is converted into a procession to a park at the summit. The final site is situated among the confluence of two major sewage canals where the city, the Dapa site and the wetland converge. Here, the 20th century sluice gate, historically owned by the colonizers, lay in the ambiguous zone of responsibility as per their maintenance and control. Through its architectural adaptation, its ownership and functioning, the structure is given back to the community who can use its spatial footprint as a solid ground for communal space and its operative capacity for water maintenance. Together, these sites aim to work holistically in creating a network of social infrastructure centered around care, repair, education and maintenance highlighting and reframing a new contemporary condition where there is a symbiotic coexistence between Kolkata's urban and rural landscape through the negotiation of its idiosyncrasies that brought about the landscape's destruction. Land terraformed for real estate is hacked and adapted to bring back legislative autonomy and ownership to the inhabitants that live off and live in it. Here, waste streams can start to be, uh, to be confronted head on and appropriated for their life-giving properties. Working together, these active buffer zones become fertile ground for celebrating the convergence of the land, human and non-human species and the many corporate bodies that maintain them. Danyabad. Thanks so much, Tanuj, and um, I loved your personal introduction where you were planning to present in Hindi, but your parents, the presenting to your parents can always be daunting no matter what language it's in, so, um, but it was really a terrific project, and um, I'm very impressed given that, as Shumi was saying, it's February, and there's so much richness in that. Um, I don't know if this relates to other cultures too, but nothing like Asian parents to tell you what you can't do. <laughs> <laughs> At least now they know where the money is going, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who would like to start the feedback from the critics? I would like to say thank you for taking me back to, that was my school route um, to go to school was through, well, when the roads were kind of made that went through Thapa because otherwise you would, you would avoid Thapa because it smelled bad. 
because of precisely what you were saying about when the sewage stuff was opened up in that part of southeast Kolkata. So like, uh, yeah, going from school, it depended, but certainly around winter, we would go via Dhapa because you could get good vegetables and they were sort of grown very locally. So they're very fresh. And yet we kind of, and it was a joke. Hey, my, you're having like cauliflower from Dhapa. That means you're eating somebody's shit from Baligunj or something. <laughs> now we would kind of joke about this stuff, but um, that was a reality. And I think um, there, there are lots of, points I think where maybe I'm riffing on the last project slightly because um, that's just what happens with a discussion that it becomes cumulative but again it seemed to me that there were sort certain aspects of certainly the way you're talking about the project towards the end of it seems like celebratory seems sort of uh, almost utopian right like we're sort of talking about shit turning into gold, turning into pleasure, turning into leisure, turning into people emancipating themselves. And um, again, I, I wonder if you might create your own project at some point to see which of the sort of seductive high notes you're hitting and which of the technical realities you're hitting to do with um, what's actually happening with land, what's actually happening with ownership, what's actually happening with dispossession um what's actually happening with allowing people to for example the growing of the cauliflowers um was not a state sanctioned activity those people are entirely precarious but suddenly because of the geological conditions their their livelihood was a lot better for a bit at least their seasonal livelihood was a lot better so what are those sorts of uh affordances that a different way of treating this land could allow um, and which of those are the sort of headline acts which can be, uh, again, those of, I don't know if anyone here has been to Kolkata, um, but that part of the wetlands has been, so there's quite a few sort of day trip type leisurely places that you would go there. There's a thing, the first ever sort of amusement park in Kolkata was opened there called Nico Park, also happened when I was at school. Um, there's... Nico Park, there's Eco Park, there's Science Park, there's, there's lots of, there's, there's sort of precedent for your sort of fun park that might happen. Um, but what are the other affordances and what makes it different? So I think um, maybe I'm getting a little bit too granular. I'm really keen to hear from people who didn't like have their childhoods on this stretch of road. <laughs> if I could jump in, I mean, it amazing aspirations and I'm I'm on board for for the ride um, so it, and it was well presented um, I guess my question would be who is this who are you taking this to in a sense and maybe it doesn't matter so please tell me if, if you don't feel that it does but are you taking this to the community are you taking this to developers are you taking this to the government because it's about infrastructure um, what is the how are you organizing or how are you imagining this would be become realized? I mean, I have, I have a million technical questions also about, you know, I think the engineering part of it is, is, uh, uh, would require the brightest, you know, the brightest minds. But, um, but I think at a base level, I just wanted to understand how, sort of whose desk does this presentation end up on or, or dining room table? Yeah, I think that's a very interesting question that I ask myself as well. Um, going back to what Shumi was saying before as to like these sort of utopic aspirations, they, they kind of touch upon governmental marginal communities and even the architect's position on the way we draw and how we present these things, they are also like questionable. I suppose for me, as I started off, it was more also understanding these kind of dualities between conservation acts, but then also demolishing buildings that also perpetuate more waste. And working between these fine lines, I suppose it's kind of an activist uh, project where it kind of shows these discrepancies between how governmental protocols have kind of collided, conservation protocols, which 
I suppose are supposed to protect the wetlands are also kind of damaging those same lines that are supposed to for environment are damaging this wetland. And the ones that are left behind are these marginal communities uh, in the middle. And I suppose in the next following months, it would be more about how to tailor this project again to find, you know, find these questions a bit more and to hit harder on them. I hope that answers your question. I don't know if it, uh, not at all. <laughs> I mean, um, and I don't mean that to be a, a smartass about it, but um, it, I guess the answer is you don't know yet. You're, you're, it's a work in progress. It's, yeah. Okay, fair enough. I just have one comment on all the presentations that were there, but you know, um, because this is a sort of an interdisciplinary critique, I would, because I know like some of you have a real realistic projects and then you, some of you have governmental projects. So how do you sort of present this to a non um, architecture practice? So, you know, if it's a government, I think that's something that as a communication, you need to really think about because, um, if you are going to talk to a government official who's not an architect, how are you going to handhold um, and take them through this process is really important. I think that's sort of from a graphic design communication uh, point of view, um, something to keep in mind, really. This is for everyone, not just you sort of like, you know, it can be quite intellectual, then it can be quite uh, raw. So how do you balance all of this and sort of communicate it in a very, um, comprehensible way. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's, it's also a question as to, I suppose, sometimes I think that there are different modes of communication for the audience that you see. And within this huge framework, I mean, you, like I said before, you've got the environmental, the government, the communities, the residents who, or even the people of the city who do not really know how the wetland functions and how do you communicate to them the importance of this? Um, yeah, these are, these are all questions that I've been kind of asking myself as well, and this is where I'm at. Right it's now. totally related yeah. to Samuel's question, no? Like Samuel was like, "Who are you selling this project? Who are you showing it to?" And that that would dictate, you know, what it is and how, and how it is that you talk about it. Um, again, I think Stuthi, I agree. It was a similar point that you raised with um, oh crap, who presented first? Anita, um, of like. What, what is the register that you want to operate as an architect? And you want to operate in a, in a sense that answers all of Samuel's questions or um, makes me cry more, that's a different emotional register, or answers to these um, so, you know, concerns to do with how certain things are presented and discussed. All of these are options, but in order for that not to be paralyzing, you need to sort of plant your flag a little bit. May I say something? My career has always been in architecture, in planning, in the middle of both. I'm an architect and I've worked for government as well and I'm working and I'm trying to put architects in the government. And we talk about it, that language and communication is so important and language is so important First of all, everybody is speaking different languages and how do they communicate? And the community, how do they talk? First, we have to hear that how do they talk differently so that we can talk to them. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? And how many aspects do you have of your project? Is a government or the residential? And and you told you said yourself that you are activist. Uh, my question is that for whom you are doing this? For whom you are the activist? Are you for the farmers? For the ruler? For, you are doing it for the ruler people. That that your land this land belong to them. Or you are you are fighting that 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 for the environmental aspect. This is your flag, the flag of yours. 
and what is driving your project. And that will take you to your next step. But one thing, you should hold to one thing and then you push that. And then, and hold the other string and they will follow. And I completely agree with you. And, and I feel that at the moment I'm studying and there are academic limitations there. Secondly, my whole study is a prescriptive study. And most of my interactions. And then I can only interact with people via Instagram. And then I can see from there that, that how they're living. And I can see from TikTok how things are going there. And then only I can see reality from there. Whatever you are saying now is so interesting. And this thing should be in your project, that you are doing this project. And how many doors can be open from sitting here? And somebody there from, from different place and they are watching it. And your story, your presentation, I want to see the TikTok video in there. And I told approve as well that I want drama. You guys are very academic. I feel even more like crying. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's about also telling it to a four-year-old, I guess. Like, how would you, how would you, sorry, I'm going to just shift this. Um, yeah, so how do you sort of explain to a four-year-old, right? Even if making it, simplifying it as much as possible when it's, when you're communicating to other people, sort of telling a story, I guess. That's what I've sort of missed um, in all the three presentations, I would say. But otherwise, I mean, incredible presentations, like thinking behind it and everything. But this is just will add value to your presentations. That's all I'm saying as a critic. <coughs> Final point would be don't, dis, uh, don't dismiss what those people know. Um, I think the difficulty is getting at what those people know and kind of, but that's maybe that's okay. Maybe we don't have to extract knowledge from everybody all the time and distill it and present it in the academy. Maybe we can still um, respect that these people know how to operate on certain types of land. They know um, what seasons will do. They know what the presence of a development company a mile away will do. Um, there's a lot of very granular knowledge that we can well, perhaps we can't assume the richness of it, but we mustn't dismiss it. Whether or not you want to tap into, use or acknowledge that knowledge of, I, I guess I'm talking about people who are using that land informally. So that might be farmers, it might be squatters, it might be construction workers, it might be um, anyone really. Um, it might be rogue developers who just decide to build something on it. That happens too. So um, I think I would just say don't, just don't feel shy to acknowledge those other forms of knowledge because they're not necessarily academically valid or even because you can't necessarily find all of it and extract all of it and present it in a believable way. I think you can still acknowledge that it's there. You know it's there. I know it's there. And we know that whatever we do there will have an impact on those people. So, again, don't, like, don't, let's not allow ourselves elephants in the room. Totally agree. I mean, one quick comment, Tanner, that, that I mentioned is, is the fact that um, more and more so, I mean, I, I attended a lecture a couple of weeks ago that spoke about, uh, that Richard Sennett was speaking about the future role of architects and people practicing within architecture is the role of a kind of civic, a more, a more activist's role, a more, uh, a more kind of community organizer, because naturally they're involved on so many different levels, right? Whether it's municipal, whether it's individual, whether it's developer, whether... And it was a very fascinating point that I feel more and more when I hear the work that you're exploring, Tanuj, or, or people that explore topics around ecology and urbanization, it's, I feel like this is where architects are somewhat free expanding their ability to act and represent 
uh, the community. And I think that's, it's, 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 it's powerful. It's kind of interesting. But one question Tony, that I would ask you is about since most, I mean, this lecture is dedicated to the exploration of language and, and operating in these different dualities. Maybe, what are your thoughts? I mean, I know it's a bit of outside the topic, but how do you feel uh, operating in Hindi and English? Well, uh, it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, I, I've been thinking about, uh, well, the, the kind of unit started off with the exploration of colonial infrastructures and the way they changed cities. And then from there, I kind of got into Kolkata and then continued on my exploration. And then, okay, here is a Hindi jury and I can speak in Hindi on a, pro on a project in a city where Hindi is actually taking over and colonizing the local languages of Bengali and where the official language is English. So do I even begin to use my like Hindi in this context, even though I am Indian and this is all just one nation. So it did give me a lot of questions, but on the other side of the translation as well, um, while I was writing the transcript, I realized, well, there is quite a lot of architectural jargon that I use for, the, for presenting to the AA. And I believe these are some of the other things that I would like to look into a bit deeper as I go forward, especially when it comes to communicating, finding the right audience and how do I communicate to them in that, in that right language. And perhaps it creates agency in a sense because you're able to operate within that jurisdiction, but also speak, not speak, but operate within a professional discipline built on a particular, I don't know. I mean, the politics of language in general, especially as somebody that's in Dubai that operates in Arabic, English, of course, Hindi is very important for us in Dubai. You cannot design and build if you don't speak Hindi. I worked in Dubai for a year and a half on the construction site, and it was just all Hindi. So yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> and it's interesting. I feel like, is it my background or education that's more important, or my skills in Hindi? I think my skills in Hindi are far more important in Dubai to operate than my professional background. So it's very interesting. I find that when you think about this role of community organizing or civicness, right, as an architect or somebody that practices within the built environment and the use of language as an important tool to build empathy and, and to be realistic in how you become an acting or act for change. Um, yeah. I mean, that's my kind of comments. It's, uh, worth I, I completely agree. Working in Dubai and being able to speak in Hindi and especially in the construction sites, it, it really mediated that barrier between me and the workers over there as well, that I knew that some of my other professional colleagues that were not able to do it, and it really did enrich the conversation, at least in that context over there. Thank you. Hey, um, Hi. So I was, I began hearing you and it is a perfect opportunity to um, hear this um, Hindi. So I moved to Hindi. Uh, translation to understand the richness of the language. So I found that the presentation had uh, the sophistication in both presentation as well as language. Um, so I said, let me now hear it in Hindi. And I uh, also found that the translator was having to pick out English words from your uh, commentary in some way, because uh, it's not always easy to be poetic in another language. And the poetry of uh, English is different from the poetry of Hindi. Okay. Um, so for me, this was a you know good opportunity to understand how it's translated into Hindi. This is a general larger point. Um, for me, what interests me in any academic project, especially, is the point of intervention or the point of entry into a project. Um, and I say that in the from the perspective that you have chosen to accept that there are these you know landfills and then work your way beyond that point as an architect. Um, sometime back, I uh, was part of a workshop, an environmental workshop, where there was a grassroots understanding of grappling with the creation of landfills. So there, were, um, there was actual um, clear information available um, how society, which is like, I would say, a very a small building block of a city, 
uh, societies in, in, in Bombay, for example, uh, can create zero waste, which means that there is no accumulated waste, which means that there are no landfills, right? So, uh, for example, when you actually begin from the perspective of the point of intervention, that your architectural intervention begins that you have this mountain of waste and then you're trying to kind of poetically deal with it or manage it or work it. Uh, if you kind of go into the grassroots of the problem, you will realize that maybe in 20 years, there will not be this opportunity of poetry, uh, this thought. Um, so, um, uh, you know, I mean, there are many systems involved in terms of uh, your life cycle of, of, you know, the waste creation uh, chart or the, of the cycle of the entire thing. Um, so just for, I'll, 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 I'll talk about that. Uh, second thing, um, what was, uh, you know, interesting for, uh, for me is that I think, I think Sam spoke for, for whom um, and how does this impact? Yeah, I know that there are challenges that we have because the opportunity for the academics is to be free, to be expressive, to do what you actually just did. So I think it's, it's, it's great. Without having a real, uh, you know, client, unless it becomes very technical um, or very, very, uh, you know, focused. So um, I, I was actually, uh, you know, I love the way you spoke. Um, I, I love the way your translator spoke for you. Um, I love the presentation um, at large. And I just urge you to think, um, you know, go back to the various points of intervention or the entry into this project. What happens if you go back, if you kind of chart the entire, you know, what causes the landfill and think backwards uh, and then see what, where that leads to. That's all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I think confronting these waste streams on an even bigger level, I mean, we could go to Coca-Cola and Nestle and like start telling them like, guys, so, or even go to Tesco because Tesco milk cartons do end up in DAPA as well. It kind of goes back to even bigger um, colonial waste streams that send, you know, from Europe all the way to Kolkata. And even though it was banned in India, in the last five years, new illegal markets have shown up where they are actually buying illegally containers of waste because people are so reliant on waste from Tesco's and Sainsbury's in Kolkata. It's so, very, yeah, it's very easy to circumvent those things. You don't even need to do it that illegally. You can just do it. Just, yeah. yeah, exactly. And I suppose even the intervention, I suppose, could even start within the domestic space as to what kind of facilities do we provide for, I suppose, like waste segregation or uh, I think, yeah, the waste in itself is a very interesting, um, yeah, very interesting thing. And I'd be curious to know a little bit more about the grassroots movement in Mumbai that you were talking about. Great. Well, thank you so much, Tanuj, and um, to all the critics for all their feedback for these first three projects. Um, I, I, I just add what his query was. So, for example, the municipality in, in Mumbai gives a specific incentive for societies who won't create waste. Um, so it's a different. We can, we can speak more later at some point. Thanks. Yeah, and when you say societies, you mean kind of like um, delineated groups of people. Housing right? societies. Right. Um, um, well, thanks for that. And I, I think some of those references are really useful, especially as the students are still developing their projects over the coming months. Um, and hopefully even beyond that to make them real in these contexts. Um, I think there's been really uh, loads of interesting conversations around language, not just between the difference of Hindi and English, but also in the languages we use, depending on the audiences we're trying to communicate to, whether that's visual or spoken. Um, on different platforms. Um, and so I think there's so much food for thought that we can bring to the discussion at the end of the session. Um, we're supposed to have a short like comfort break now. Um, if we don't mind making that a little bit shorter, like if it could just be like five minutes so we can catch up a bit on time because there's three more great presentations to come, that would be great. So, I mean, maybe we can come back at like 12.20, um, which I think is trying to do the, like, I guess, uh, five, 50 um in india so if if um if we could take a little break now and come back for the next three that would be great yeah i think um i'll be just sort of leaving now as well so i have to catch a train <laughs> um so it was really lovely to catch up with everyone here like it's amazing so sorry i won't be uh, attending other projects but uh, i can leave my email if anyone wants to talk or chat about anything and um yeah lovely meeting you all That'd be terrific. Thank you so much, Tati. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, the jury, for the great feedback. I really appreciate it.
Thank you. Great. So I'll see everyone back here in around five minutes. So um, I guess as the first three projects were kind of looking at environment and landscape in different ways, um, both urban and rural and everything in between, I think the next three are kind of maybe more storytelling projects or, you know, have their origins in looking at kind of cultural stories, histories, myths, etc. So um, the next student to present is Reva Kushwa from Experimental Unit 2, and she'll be presenting Sitayana Sita's journey. Uh, so I'll start. Namaste. Uh, uh, hi, my name is Reva. I am in the second year, and I am uh, I I am doing this. Uh, I am going to present this uh, uh, project, Sitayana. In November 2020, the Faculty of Tate Britain was adjourned with colors and lights to mark the festival of Diwali, the Hindu festival of lights. Every year, about a billion people worldwide celebrate this festival. Here we can uh, see the spirit of festival beaut beautifully captured by photographer Arko Data. Diwali has its roots in one of the greatest uh, uh, mythological epics of India, the Ramayan, that was written by the sage Valmiki in the 5th century BCE. In a nutshell, the story of Raman is as follows. The Prince Rama of Adeona, due to the series of unfortunate events, is exiled from his kingdom into the forest where his wife Sita and his brother Lakshman follow him. One day they run into an altercation with a demon woman and uh, Laxman chops her uh, her nose off in a bit of uh, fury. The woman goes back into the king, uh, kingdom and narrates the ordeal to her brother, the demon king of Lanka, Ravana. In a bit of uh, obedience, uh, Ravana abducts Ram's wife Sita and takes her back to his kingdom. What follows is Rama and his army of monkey men marching to Ravana's kingdom, defeating and killing Ravana, finally rescuing Sita and returning home. Diwali is celebrated to commemorate their victory in the battle and their homecoming. This is the most appropriate version of the story. However, Ramayan has about 300, region, uh, 300 regional uh, variations, not only in different parts of India, but also countries like Japan, Malaysia, and Philippines. Other than these versions, it has also thousands of interpretations by different people and groups, some of which have turned into best-selling novels today. However, Ra Ramayan is increasingly being used as a political tool in India, as Arsha St uh, Sattar remarks. This desire to restore the ideal kingdom stems from an anti-West sentimental um, created in the minds of many Indians after the British colonialized uh, India. In a bid to restore this ideal kingdom, Hindu extremists believed it was necessary to have an ideal version of Ramayan too. So attempts were made to destroy alternate versions of the story, often the versions belonging to Salbatam groups and minorities. So, but, so we can hear, uh, hear that an exhibition show, showcasing India's different Ramayans was attacked by extremists in 1993. We can see that in 1993, there was exhi exhibit different Ramayan and was attacked by extremists. But today, the, the politicalization of Ramayan has taken a much more violent form in a quest to have a singular version. Today's religious and cultural minorities and women are sub, uh, subjected in the name of Ram, in the name of one singular version of the story, in the name of ideal kingdom. So I decided to investigate the story and see that it, if it is really represented, may, maybe Banaras are actually tribal men. Maybe the so-called gods were actually the oppressors and so-called demons were the ones being oppressed. But my most striking observation was the misogyny embedded in the story, in the after story. In after story, Rama suspects that Sita has had illicit relationship with Ravana during her captivity and therefore makes her walk through a fire to prove her uh, chastity and purity. Even after she passes the test, he still chooses to abandon her and she's exiled alone in the forest on his orders. However, despite that, the, 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 brut the, the brutality, she 
she faces in the story, the character of Sita, and also shown as a strong, independent woman in the story, a single mother of two. And for some communities, she is revered as a goddess, the goddess of the earth. I found Sita the most intriguing character in the story and decided to create my project based on her life. Sita's character has long been judged, misinterpreted and overshadowed. And through my project, I aimed not only to re-establish her character as a resilient woman, but also, uh, also defy the singular version of the story. To translate her life into architecture, I identified 10 keys, uh, 10 events of her life and found a set of Mudbani paintings for them. The traditional art field of Madhubani has its origin in Sita's wedding. I decided to extract spatiality through these flat and eccentric Im images. For, for, uh, for precedence, I looked at uh, uh, Amavad Ni Gufa by, by B.V. Doshi that, uh, that perfectly in, in capitalizes the eccentric curves from the forms present in the uh, paintings. I also studied a few pavilions and the organic curves and intricate features like the painting. In term, I tried visualizing one of the spaces corresponding to the event of a marriage. For the same, I looked at more paintings associated with the event and studied crucial elements and patterns in the paintings. I then proceeded to create a visualization of the space, which is a section. I was really intrigued by the free flowing canopy in, in this drawing and decided to further develop that space. So in the term two, I did a more, fa a more accurate 3D model of it, the scheme would be uh, would be for the canopy to depict Sita's life and span around the sea, uh, site. About the site, there are many significant sites in South Asia they, uh, that are the relevance of Sita's life, but I chose my Sita uh, as the Valmiki uh, Ashram, located in the Chitwan forest in, uh, uh, in Nepal, where Sita is believed to have taken refuge after she exiled by Rama. This is also the site where uh, sage Val Valmiki that wrote the Ramayan um, uh, resided. As one goes through the main gate, a 200 mile uh, meters walk leads the visitors to the small templates. One decided to see the one dedicated to the other gods like Shiva. Next to the temple, there are seas of landmark that are believed associated with Sita's life exile. This is a rough map of the site that I created in term, but and also more uh, accurate site plan. The scheme is uh, for uh, is for the canopy to take an alternative road that depicts Sita's life of her exile, and after that, for into merge with existing feature on the site. So. I started developing my design, my first for formality, uh, how to intervene with the already existing architecture. I looked at different possibilities of, of uh, intervening with the already existing Sita temple, one delegate by Rachel uh, Whitehead and one bold and by striking from by Thomas uh, Heatherwick. I wanted to create a minimal intervention so as to not interrupt the, the, the sanctity of the temple. So I origin, originally tried covering the interior surface and opening with the delicate pattern. I also cut an organic curve shaped opening in the roof to allow for more light in the temple. This is the process of how I created the tested my pattern. And then I also developed surface drawing for my proposal. However, later in the process, I, cho I chose to not pursue this idea and keep the pattern as a grill of the opening of the temple. Next. Next, I studied how the canopy would connect with the temple, not from outside, but also from, from, uh, from inside. Then I studied the canopy would connect with the temple, not only from the outside, but also from inside. There are, quite, uh, there are quick sketches testing the same. I finally went with these options. So this is a summary of the design cho choices for Sita's temple, but also an overall scheme for how the canopy would span around the temple complex. You can also see how I chose not to engage with the other, uh, other temple, but I found if it is irrelevant to Sita's life and her, her story. Currently, I am in a stage of, uh, uh, of exploring how to intervene with the landmarks. 
For the same, I decided to intervene with them in the way that all restores them. So, so I decided to replace their signboards and fix their fissures and cracks by having an intervention of ceramic. I also wanted to restore them because uh, they were not in a very good condition. So I then I uh, I uh, I decided to remove uh, this uh, uh, the signpost uh, by having an intervention of ceramic. Not only would the cracks be filled with ceramics, but also landmark uh, would be surrounded by mosaics on the floor of unique patterns such as the series of QR code. And this was a very simple concept that how these ceramics would look with the landmarks. The idea is that the signboards and intervention should also be there and also the, the, the visitors will also uh, scan those QR codes. And finally, this is a very big scheme on my site and you can see that the canopy, uh, it goes towards the temples and, and you can also see the other temple of Sita and, and it goes into the landmarks. Thank you. Thanks so much, Reva. That was really incredible. And um, I, I liked how you talked about the personal resonance of Sita's story, but then also how you looked at both the site, the the impact of kind of the folklore around it. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really um, excited to, to hear what the panel thinks about the project and where you could take it. Thanks. Shumi, I think you have to start us off. Really? I'm just like fizzing. I was just like, maybe I should wait. Sorry, I, I already let a lot out in the chat box. So I'm just very excited by this project and very proud of you, River, for talking about stuff. You know, you wouldn't be able to do this if you were doing architecture school at JJ, don't you? Yeah. Um, so let's do it. <laughs> and so I really uh, love the fact that you're doing it and just wanted to commend you for that. Um, so I might jump straight into what I want to say about your project, which is because there's loads of good things to say about it, but just in the interest of time. Yeah. I think it's important that your project and process um, reflect your sort of objections to the manipulations of the um, religious and folkloric stories. Mm -hmm. um, they are to be found all over Vedic interpretations. Last week was uh, Saraswati Puja, and you all know we're never told to be like Saraswati, who's the goddess of wisdom, also the goddess of flow, as it happens. Um, but there's like two temples in India to Saraswati because wise women are dangerous, huh? and we should be like Lakshmi instead, who's like nice. Um, so I really like that you're kind of picking up on, as, as manager said, a sort of a story that has piqued um, not only you personally, but also um, it kind of points a finger at the problems of using, if it wasn't obvious, the problems of using millennia old dogma to then inform the current political situation and how, that, how those things um, unravel. So the condition of women in India the condition of uh, marginalized communities in India, the, specifically the condition of forest dwelling marginalized communities in India, um, is all stuff that your project must, I think, deal with if it's taking this position. And so that brings me to your canopy um, and the sort of craftsmanship, the sort of materiality, the sort of affordance that it could allow, right? I think um, if I was just to take one thing, one problem, um, and I, I will say as an expat person of Indian origin, I do find it difficult to talk about issues in India because I'm neither a citizen nor somebody who's spent the majority of my life there. It's difficult, but I feel it very much. So I'm glad you're doing it. Um, so just to talk about things like the CAA, where indigenous peoples who are perhaps occupying the forest for millennia as well, with their own folklores um, are for whatever reason not considered um, the CIA if anybody isn't following Indian politics and, and it's not very much reported here 
but it's a very ethnically driven, um, inhumane sort of citizenship um, amendment act. That's what the AI stands for. And basically, if you're not Hindu or one of the religions that fundamentalist Hindus decided to like, uh, they don't really want you to be a citizen. And it's an incredibly violent act that was ratified at the end of 2019. So I think, you know, we haven't mentioned it, but it needs to be, your canopy needs to know that it's the anti-CAA somehow, right? Um, so I think I just wanted to, because you're dealing with a temple mm -hmm. and it's a place of religious worship, there's a possibility for it to speak to exclusions of certain things. So I'm sure you're aware of that, but um, I'm very excited by the way that this flowing thing that leaves the temple, that comes from outside of it, passes through it and leaves it, um, could perhaps be emancipatory in kind of the ways that it's produced, the ways that it's made, what it's made of, uh, and all sorts of ways. But I think it's important that it does that. Okay, that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Reva. Maybe both I am really happy that you are looking at this uh, subject. I was also last week thinking that today, that what do we... I don't know, I tried. How do you like the feminist uh, independence? And I was... Uh, I was uh, looking at the, uh, the campaign and I'm also giving this talk next week, a very um, short talk about, uh, about connection uh, in space and in Indian feminism and how different groups uh, uh, have disputes about land. My question is this, that this subject, uh, that who is modern day Sita? And will you? And is your project going to be about that? What you have done is very, very good. But uh, I'm just scared that this is that will become it will become a little bit symbolic and it will this pavilion will be a symbol and the strength of the project, that will be questionable. That, that how does a woman look? Or uh, what is the perception of a woman towards India? What is the story of a woman? And this story about Sita, is, is this going to be a start and starting point? Like you have said that this is a, a temple in Nepal. Uh, how do the women from there, would they be thinking about it? But this pavilion will be about them. And how will this project be moving forward? And there is a danger that it will be uh, like a symbol. Is this a, a starting point? You understand what I'm trying to get to. Sorry, I'm struggling. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Hi, Pooja. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm looking for the name. Reva, sorry. <laughs> okay, Pooja, um, I think you spoke about symbolism and I think it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a very, very focused project. I appreciate that. Um, also a very challenging project. And I'll tell you, uh, in my opinion, uh, where the challenges lie. So one is the challenge of building a narrative, uh, right? And, and narrative seems to be structured well. Um, I read the brief or the, the concept note you had mentioned, and you spoke about, um, you know, spatial interpretation using Madhubani. Uh, so one is, yes, the larger of the, the feminism uh, discussion or discourse. And then second is that there is a translation of that into a real project. And that's where there's always the biggest struggle. Uh, what is the language, for example, the, tra the language, talking about uh, translation today, so it's interesting to kind of put this out over here as a, another translation, because here you have a student who's trying to translate 
art or uh, traditional um, you know forms of art to a valid architectural or spatial proposition um and that's a challenge i mean it's it's a uh, for anybody i mean uh, it's also an opportunity uh, and i and i saw that you kind of looked at hussein doshi gufa and when i saw your uh, cross section um you know before being this uh, this talk or this uh, jury i i saw a very clear you know um, i would say uh, with association uh, of that uh, i was just interested in understanding uh, what are the strategies tools means methods that you use to be able to translate uh, this this world of madhubani which actually you know uses paper it uses natural dyes it uses um, it uses rice powder uh, you know like um, it, and and and, uh, and the stories that it has it means, for example madhubani uh in most madhubani art they don't leave any blank space it's almost like architecture which is blank space and and, and these enclosures so there there a lot of uh, you know conceptual uh, uh handles to be able to draw from uh, such references uh, and for me uh, i always look for handles in any project um because those handles let you generate ideas and operate the entire project uh they help guide you creatively they help uh, give you a cohesive a coherent uh, process to kind of take it through to a to a conclusion which then reflects upon the point of origin now in this case yes there is a there's a discourse of feminism there's a discourse of of you know spatial inspiration of madhubani and one more thing we have forgot to add was in your in your mention is a brief for myself um happy to have that kind of uh, you know expression as well uh, my only uh, question to you was um how do you like i'm just interested curious actually to understand the logic you have used or the intuition you have used to be able to construct this to end up in this you know flowing kind of um, you know non madhubani uh, i don't know how would you kind of translate it but i don't know that's it's open transition but how did you end up over there almost like this i wouldn't say frank eddy but this flowing uh, thing uh, in space uh, thanks um yeah so like i agree that like it's a very vast world and like there are even so many types of paintings and you have a lot to work with um and then also there's the fact that traditionally madhubani paintings were done on surfaces like on walls or uh, floors so there's also that spatial connotation to them but i suppose like in my process there was obviously a lot of intuition involved um and i guess like um there's like no set methodology for each of my derivations from those paintings uh but i suppose like in all of that i knew that they were at the end of the day um uh, a sort of president or something for me to look at to develop my design process to like fall back on when i'm stuck in my design and yeah like there was no sort of set method for like all three of my interventions but i suppose it was like i was sort of influenced by the mood of the image the patterns and i also like tried at least in the earlier part interpreting like the symbols of like the objects that were in those images so uh, yeah i mean the, the question was that could this have resulted in an installation uh, was it part of the brief like could it just have been an abstract installation um, rather integrating it with other uh, you know architectural elements say if you remove this out of architecture and think of yourself as an artist now as a contemporary artist uh, or a sculptor then what would be the outcomes of this project that, that was my other question uh i think i mean i think that it would kind of be on the similar lines cuz like throughout the project i was not only just like looking at it from the perspective of an architect but also from from a perspective of let's say a curator or uh, an artist and like a lot of the elements in my project are not just architecture related uh, and a lot of my references are also from sculptors and artists so i think like it's very sort of let's say fluid in that sense also that it can easily take 
like several forms of expression, not only through architecture, I suppose. I'd love to pick up on that point because, and again, I'm perhaps the least qualified on this panel to, <laughs> to comment either on the topic or the subject. But one of the things that, that really struck me is that I was incredibly impressed with the first half dozen slides and the topic and the things that you were looking at from, from politics to um, gender equality, misogyny, all of, and all of that. Then when you started going into the architectural expression of that, I was immediately, my first thought was, oh my God, architecture doesn't have the, the medium of architecture doesn't have this, the strength. And, and I might label myself a, a pessimist in this, but I don't, I don't think so. But architecture doesn't have the tools to express the things that need to be expressed with a topic of this nature and the breadth of it. And so I immediately started thinking about, you know, art practices and poetry and dance and music and other forms of, of expression and articulation that I think you will need to broaden, as you just alluded to yourself, you'll need to broaden outside of purely architectural expression, um, you know, forms, materials. I mean, the, the closest thing I could think of is kind of Maya Lin's um, Vietnam Memorial. But, but even that, you know, for the things that you're talking about would, I think would fall short. Um, because it's not a simple solution. It's not a simple articulation. There's the complexity of what you've taken up, which is is to be applauded. Um, but you, the the ability of the medium uh, by itself to to kind of comment on that, I, I think, would be in, it's an incredibly complex uh, problem. And I, I don't have a comment other than that, but I, I think the thing that I would say is look outside of formal expression, material expression, the language of, of those things, and it has, to, it has to draw on deeper experiences. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, I agree, thanks. Rashid, did you wanna add? Any comments before we? I mean, other than, I, I think the presentation was really inspiring uh, with regards to the context. Can everybody see me? Yeah. Yeah, I think it was very inspiring and very moving. And I think, uh, I mean, I, the, the only question that I have is do you feel like the project is exclusively a political or a Kind of beyond its beyond beyond the, the, this the ability to communicate the heritage of it. Do you feel like it's politically motivated or exclusively yeah. politically motivated? I mean, I know that I I certainly don't want it to become like another vessel for like the whole enforce, reinforcing heritage and reinforcing uh, thousand year old traditions. Uh, I know that, so I guess that means that it is more sort of politically motivated and it's trying to address like contemporary issues. Um, yeah, I think that's the case. I'm so sorry. I know I talk a lot at these things. <laughs> Um, but there's like a couple of things that I kind of, one of the things that I loved about the presentation Rainbow is that it was super smart. It's it, because signage, not a romantic or a sort of um, sexy thing that a lot of architects look at. Signage in the way that you're directing people around your site. In fact, the way you're labeling things, the way you're providing information via QR code rather than what is explicitly written on the signboard allows you possibly um, the means to kind of supply other informations as well. Although that's obviously not in your hands, but you know, the mechanism is there. I think the fact that you address signage, um, labeling, navigation around the site is both, it, it, I think it's a real crux. It's where the politics and the design and the su super mundane banal practicality of what is essentially gonna be a site of pilgrimage. Um, but it's where you can really 
the fact that you picked up on that kind of made me very happy because it sort of meant that you were not being overly romantic. Oh, there's a chance that you could rescue your project from being overly symbolic or overly romantic and use this kind of rather banal functional performative which has to happen at a site of pilgrimage mm -hmm. um, to sort of intervene um, whether or not you abstract the story to find the design or whatever um, abstract a painting rather to find a designer that, that that's you know you're, you're the designer I'm not but I think that's where I found the acuity of the project to flip myself though to sort of really undermine all of that the other thing that I was looking at um, and this is kind of goes out to Apoorv because I was telling him to talk about the, all the stuff that we don't really want to acknowledge. Can't stop looking at design and thinking of how many Bollywood films have I watched where the heroine is kind of uptight good girl makes the tea at home. And then when she goes out to meet her lover on the hillside, Ballu flying. It's mm -hmm. liberated fabric that is otherwise wrapped around your body that suddenly only on the hillside, you won't see that anywhere else. It's only when she's running to meet her boyfriend will her balu be flying. And I couldn't get that image out of my head while I was looking at your thing. And I wonder, I, I'm not, I used to really mind those kind of subconscious, slightly tacky references, but they exist for a reason. They exist in the sort of common, uh, how can I say, common image through Bollywood uh, across India more than you know, other kind of nationalistic elements in other countries. So I don't know, it was present for me. I don't know if it was present for you when you designed it, but it's funny, the Balu is only there when the woman is quote unquote liberated. Yeah, I mean, yes, they're really interesting observations that like even I hadn't really exactly thought about while working about this, but it definitely brings a very interesting insight to the project. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Reva. I mean, I, I think there's a real power to the story as well, like, and also how stories get co-opted by different groups to tell their version of it. And I think you really hit on that from the very beginning or even from the title of your project and the versions of stories that, you know, different groups tell each other and how it's been misappropriated. And I think the experience of your project should address that in some way, because I think, you know, through allegory and, and things like that, I think there's ways to to tell political stories um, that kind of work as a Trojan horse or sit below the radar or only speak to certain groups in certain ways. And so maybe as you develop your architecture, the story and the power of the storytelling can, can be developed alongside that in the way that you've analyzed the Ramayana and reframed re it as the Sitayana. So I'm really excited to see how it develops. Is that one thing my sister, uh, I'm going to speak in English for this, my sister and I have been recently really obsessed by Kalima, just as like a figure, a kind of, yeah, exactly that kind of goddess that is so much more, exactly what um, Shuni was saying earlier, like the, the difference between aspiring to be Sita or, you know, versus actually Kalima is a really cool um, inspiration. So we've been thinking about that quite a lot. <laughs> Great, well, um, we probably should move to the next presentation, which is by Arman, who um, is currently on his year out, but is gonna present his project from last year in Experimental 10 called The Lost Trail. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Arman. I don't think any Indian person really says uh, namaste anymore, but um, so as manager mentioned, I'm on my year out. So I'll be presenting my project from last year because my project I'm doing this year is a bit too um, asli and um, boring. So I'll just share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay. So um, I did experimental 10, which works with a word, which last year was plot. And uh, plot can be interpreted in different ways. So whether it's a storyline, a piece of land, a way of representation. And uh, mine takes the storyline definition of a plot and makes small interventions around the world over a span of the year to establish a project with uh, a plot at the end of the year. Um, so yeah, Yatra, though thank you, it was so 
The journey starts with the extraction of two objects and the reunion. I first found a radio where I extracted its essential pieces so that its music still plays. The second object was a mattress. It was transported to AA, which led it to being cut and its marriage with the radio to form a chair that plays the radio music when someone is sat on it. So in contrast to its unwanted components, the chair was made strange enough to attract an audience. The next chapter of this journey sees me in Venus where I study transport and within the transport, I decided to focus on the bridges because that is what I mostly used. I looked at all different types of bridges, street to street, street to door, then the Ponte de Tre Ponte, which was a strange mixture of different eras using materials. In this object too, I saw a journey or a timeline of how it is constructed from wood to break, to marble, and it also told its own story. Each fragment wasn't in its right place and they did not belong with each other, which almost helped me construct its construction process. The next chapter is about me returning to London. However, not without this bridge. I plonked it on an island that I saw from an aeroplane window as a collage. The intervention fit, it was displaced and it affected its surrounding uses, creating a new purpose for the island. But more importantly, a condition in Venice. So I look back at what I forgot, which was Venice, where people who walked had to take different routes and the routes of the boat remained unaffected. I had slices of essential organ and plugged it into a new context, which changed the architecture of the host, but also its previous body, just like I did to the objects like the radio and the mattress. So I decided to look back at them again. The next chapter is about being encouraged to look at the wider system of lost and forgotten objects that are placed from their original owners. I remember the story of how my friend lost his belt on the way back from this journey and I looked at the London Lost Property Office, which is the LPO. It, it was first located in Baker Street and then shifted to South Kensington. Thousand items came into this office every day with only 100 being reclaimed and the rest becoming a part of LPO storage or the archive collection, as I want to call it. It is not only object that the London Transport owes, but sites such as the Northern Heights project, which happened to be a trail I visited. This stretches from Mill Hill East, which is the end of the Northern Line and the Edgeware Station. You can see the trace of something that would have been from this empty stretched line. The project was never completed because of the world war and now it's full grown, overgrown plants and developing crush commercial area around it. This strip of land is quite hidden and its neighbors from its neighbors because the topography of the area and the fact its entrance lies through a backyard. And then a graffiti brick arch. The end of the line poses opportunity to someone thing to start. My project seeks to decentralize the LPO collection and display it along this side. It's interesting for me for these objects to be lost there. Instead of being stored away for no one to look at, this area of the object that could have never belonged together, in my opinion, belong on, to, on display for all to look at. I'm going to switch to English because um, it might get... Uh, a bit in the, in the middle because it might get a bit hard to understand the project. Uh, so I concluded that in this site, it would be most natural for these units to be spread along and hidden in this walk. I looked at items that are lost and I put this data into graphs that would help me with the categorization of the archive. The lost objects in the LPO can be arranged in various categories, whether it's by value, which would be the hardest to accurately and fairly determine. The size, the color, the date found, and each being as wonderful to look as a collection. Each collection requires a different display and home and thinking in terms of arrangement.
मैंने इस कलेक्शन को उसके आई डिसाइडेड टू डिक्टेट माय आर्किटेक्चर बाय थिंकिंग अबाउट द टेंपरेरीली एंड द परमानेंस ऑफ दिस कलेक्शन the temporary collection would be placed closer to the road networks making them more accessible and the permanent collection would be placed further away structures is collection ka kuch structures would be a temporary residence or the home for this collection and would care for them and hence both the function and architecture would be defined by material this arrangement would generate more unpredictable pattern of objects एक बहुत सुंदर पैटर्न बना कलर्स एंड on site according to material uh the local population consists of uh, young school children office workers and retired people it calls for people who have not just lost items but also all sorts of buyers and explorers including the locals that can find a cheap way to buy useful materials and interesting objects the trail remains intact with these buildings plugged in that brings another layer of visitors to the site also improving the market's uh, economy and the places around this trail for the people who have actually lost the object the long tube journey in the trail was all forgotten and uh, turned into an experience where you both find and find out the wonders of this displaced display um i decided to make these structures thin and hidden within the forest like a forest trail and i was thinking about how the place could be an ever growing and moving uh, place and i thought about a rail system to move the shelves to change the architecture of the building itself each structure would use um, its topography to build uh, around the nature and disguise itself these sect- these this is the rail system that are developed um with a ts detail of how they might work the shelves um these sections show the textile building and the metal buildings and how they differ from one another because of the architectural elements used the facade the shape and uh, the they facilitate protective interior for the collections the muslin curtains for example protect the clothes from direct sunlight and little moisture and the etfp panels in the metal building keep the moisture to a minimum for the uh, electronics for example these renders show the outside of the metal storage uh, and of the textile building the exterior is different because both outside elements and the collections that are available on the inside the proposal also provides for two more buildings that are built from the lost groceries which is a free cafe of sorts and the lost paper which would be the library the food is replaced the um, every day and new fresh food is brought in from the lost groceries in the library the books can be checked out and read here these functions call for the use of a site as a place of relaxation and discovery i realize the structures are to look like a modern domestic building uh, but they do have openings on the sides which is a highly accessible uh, form of collection and uh, the seating's around uh, mm. the parameters of the building hint out an invite for the visitors to use them the addition of the porch and the organically placed pillars provide for a smooth uh, transition from the forest to the structure and also serve an aesthetic purpose the fact that the shelves can be rearranged to a certain kind of randomness aims for the user to forget that they've entered a different space from the forest this is the entrance that provides a smooth transition without doors directions or sign walls and the auction house will be at the very end of the structure after uh, a user sub- looked at the entire collection jaise radio ko matters pe aur venice ke pool ko london mein uh, ek nayi jagah mili like ek naya dekhne like just like a plugging in the foreign bridge on the island focuses a news perspective in the same way the new structure and the lpo collection adds a further narrative and fitting purpose for the size once we have found what you were looking for you see more and for this long project but you are happy and have a sense of discovery that might force you to stay longer than you wanted to seeking out this objects adds experience and hence will you to them that is what my proposal intends occupy this trail not because you need to but because you feel you want to
Thanks, Arman. That was a really interesting journey you took us on. And I think in the theme of translation, it's interesting how your ideas have translated from your material experiments to taking them then to Venice to then back to, to London. And then, you know, at the end, like kind of taking us back, to, uh, zooming out, I guess, to help us understand how these ideas moved across. And um, I liked how you also just switched between the two languages as you presented. Thank you. Super excited. Um, uh, maybe it's my uh, training as a product designer as well. Um, and also being in the design, um, uh, you know, like both the space design and product and, and graphic design kind of space uh, for a while. Um, even the first image, um, actually, you know, that uh, opening image, you not bend, uh, the way it's taken, the way it's conceptualized. Um, yeah, uh, I was pretty impressed. Uh, I, I like the word that you used at one point, find versus find out. Um, and I try, I try to kind of uh, add to that another, another kind of combination of, because yours is linked to collection of objects in some way. Collection versus collective, um, maybe that kind of, you know, holds some uh, value for you. Um, I like the idea of loss. Um, I mean, the way you dealt with the idea of loss in some way. Um, and then you quantify that and the value of experience uh, to kind of counter, counter propose that. Uh, for me, um, the renders, the actual outcome were too formal, um, uh, too formal, uh, too obvious, uh, somehow, at least in a bit. Uh, a long time back, there was a project which I worked on, which was, you know, like a, a lodge in a forest and, and, and the concept, the conceptualization of that lodge where uh, thinking of it as people, uh, nomadic tribes who have actually you know, inhabited that space and left those uh, uh, habitats. Uh, so they've, they've let go, they've almost lost the habitats and moved on. So in some way, the idea that uh, not only objects, but architectural spaces or uh, so to say structures can also have that same resonance or the same uh, possibility, uh, if you want to use that, that term. And uh, just thought I'll, 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 I'll share that. Uh, in some way, I found some, you know, Bernachumi folies, in, you know, like kind of uh, interspersed somewhere, somewhere uh, in, in a kind of natural environment. There was some, some, some reference there as well. But um, super exciting to kind of see the, the using the, like all the other projects as well. Uh, I think the variety has been amazing uh, to, to see the kind of projects that we are seeing today um, and, the, and the conceptual, um, you know, posturing or possibilities that they are actually leaning towards. So uh, thank you. Comments from other people on the panel? Shumi? Well, it's like, turn on the tap. <laughs> yeah, um, I'd, I'd really like to, I saw Samuel nodding. I'd like to hear uh, some things from others too. But I mean, there's, I, I really enjoyed the presentation and the conviction that you have in some of the moves that you're making. Um, I think that there's, Again, I think you, as well as your colleagues, would do well to sort of give yourself a challenge of like synthesizing a couple of sentences that articulate specific critical action of your project. Um, because that's an area where, I mean, you've got time, as, as we keep saying, to develop the formal operation and to some extent, uh, you know, material realization and so on and so on. But um, the sort of critical act of your project I think that's very rich, but I'm not, I, I don't know if I'd be able to summarize it in a couple of minutes from your presentation. So that would be one like tip of thing to do next. Um, without that, I was kind of, uh, also because my Hindi's a bit, um, I was sort of leaving myself space to, to, to think some other things. It reminded me a lot of um, an old exhibition that I saw when I was a student called Celebration Park by an artist called Pierre Huig, I think. I, pronouncing his name terribly. Um, just because it had moving panels and the sort of, it was a very magical experience to be in, in terms of being shut off from certain views and opened to certain views, certain things being open to me and other things being closed to me in terms of a spatial experience and a dynamic spatial experience. Um, it was interesting. It's, it's kind of nothing to do with your project, but it, Celebration Park is about Disney 
And Disneyfication of culture is something that also sprang to mind when we, we talk about Venice and other sort of venues like that, that have almost become more important as an image rather than the functioning, like Venice is a terrible city to live in. It's like really awful, but um, it's beautiful. And that is its value in a way. So there's a sort of Disneyfication or sort of, I think the word that is lurking around in the shadowy bits of my mind when I'm thinking about your project is extraction, I think. And um, the notion of uh, profiting either financially or culturally from stuff that wasn't intended that way. So um, there's, there's some sort of, I haven't quite worked it out probably because I haven't quite understood all of your presentation because I was trying to listen to it in Hindi. Um, but given what and where you're talking about, I want to hear, or I want to know that you're at least clear on who's getting what from whom and the sort of politics of that, um, the commodification of certain things um, are, are questions that I'm sure you have a position on. Um, they're not sort of loud and clear in the project as yet, but they're questions raised by it. I'll leave it there. Sure. Thank you. Um, the I think the first of all to answer my my mic was muted, so I didn't notice. But the how the actual renders came out. I think the renders were kind of rushed towards the end because I kind of got lost in the collection itself, like the whole graphs and what they are and how what I can do with them. And uh, at the end, kind of took a decision to display them. But um, about who's getting what. I think um, it's kind of clear that the uh, storage, the LPO, like the lost property office itself works on kind of like, um, it sustains itself with what it earns. And uh, the basically, um, the only advantage here would be for the people, for the site itself and the people who visit it. Cause uh, right now the site's kind of empty. Like nobody really uses it like uh, one or two people a day. So I think it would add like uh, another um, uh, layer to the site where people can visit this site and uh, it wouldn't, it would be occupied because it is a beautiful site. I've been there a lot of times, like when I did this project and everything. And the fact that uh, nobody really goes there, it's kind of um, really um, dangerous in a way to go there because people start questioning what you actually are doing there. Because so I was questioned a lot of times, like, why are you on this site? But it's a beautiful site to be at. So I think, it would um, it would answer that question for people when they do want to go visit the site. Well, maybe there's some more prosaic things you can do with your sliding doors as well, like frame particular views and so on. That would, uh, yeah, as you say, allow the space to be appreciated in particular ways. True. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Arman. Just a quick question: What do you think the imminent thing that you're trying to tackle within this project? I mean, given bigger issues that, that we're facing? How do you um, think the project is? I think this project kind of goes through different stories and different kind of tasks that we did. And the basic, uh, the major kind of, if you ask me like, um, what am I trying to achieve? Like the bigger idea behind it. I think it was um, more to do with uh, an archive and how things are displayed and what they actually, the connection to a person would be especially finding a new home for the LPO because um, they are planning to shift it out of South Kensington uh, in the next year because the collection's grown uh, even bigger. Because as I said, like a thousand items come in and only every day and only a hundred reclaimed. So it kind of is growing exponentially. So they're trying to find a new home and that's where I proposed a new home to be at. So it wasn't tackling something like a bigger issue than that. I think it was, it rested at I know this project was started last year. So I won't talk much about the project. Uh, you some artists or some books, you would like them. And then they'll talk about the things and the stories when I was there. 
and wo, I like the job. Objects, cheese, co, co, um, and I used to see object and things, so, and then used to take the photograph. And then he takes the pictures of the city and then makes the connection. And then he put the photos on the on the floor. And then he makes a big collage which gives the story of the city. So probably you would like his work. And he talks about the urbanism. Secondly, I was thinking. Uh, this another author and his book is Museum of Innocence. When I went to Istanbul and that was a physical interpretation and I like that. The combination of history and stories. I'm switching this for a second. The power of organizing certain objects together. You have a power of curating things. You you're creating a story, and, and that was really powerful. How he was, um, they were like pointing towards certain like political issues. Or so this question that um, uh, Shabib's asking, she's asking around what is the bigger implication you have as a curator. You have that power of narrative so that's something to think about and the last thing maybe this is a bit obvious but I don't know I was really obsessed by George Parikh or um, uh, Life for Users Manual it takes one section of the building how people live in there and it thinks in a different scales and this thing the flat or the building and how how all this look like probably you may like that as well i thoroughly enjoyed it thank you i would um i mean i i think the comments that people have made before also um made a lot of sense to me and, and resonated in that way. I was listening also in, to the Hindi channel initially because I think the English um, started up about halfway through. So I was only getting 50% uh, of the first half. But I think one of the things that's fascinating to me is that this is a kind of not just presentation, but representation of a kind of real time archaeology that's happening. And, and it's almost as if because you've you've taken these to a desolate site on the outskirts of an urban uh, context, it, almost a place that's hidden or forgotten in the way that you would, like if you go to Lothal or any of these other um, uh, places, Hampi, places that are sort of ruins of civilization, um, that you would find um, these archeological digs, or you would find these artifacts and they're kind of presented in, in some of the similar ways that you're also presenting this, but these are, it's a comment of contemporary context. And so for me, that was, that was quite interesting. It kind of displays um, values, it displays consumerism, it dis displays, it sort of comments almost un, um, apolitically or without comment it just kind of presents these are the things that we don't care enough about to keep track of these are the things we buy and discard and so the the kind of um yeah i think just the the very documentary style um without a real agenda or at least that was my understanding of it uh presentation of these things was was the strength of it so um i just commend you on that and and very well articulated as well, uh, visually and, and in your presentation. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah I mean, I I think um, all the feedback has been really uh, great. And I think Arman, because you, are, compared to everyone else, you're presenting a project that you kind of finished working on a while ago. I think it's interesting in terms of that question that Rashid asked you about, like, what's the bigger topic that you're looking at? Maybe like having time to reflect on that. Like, what are the things that you would take forward into future projects from this one is a good one. And I, I think to pick up on something that um, Salim said about about maybe the renders being too formal. Like, I think there's a white 
or something that yeah, I recognize the rent is being too forward and I think I have two weeks because my current plan sections have gone for structural analysis so I have uh, two three weeks to actually think about this maybe right now yeah I mean I think I don't know there's like a wildness or the of forest like of the forest or also of like um there's these foreign elements that you're transplanting across different contexts and I don't know that feeling of of like I guess that how how something responds is um, I think really interesting in your project whether it's an object that you move into a different context or whether you transport a whole structure into a new place and so I think that feeling you know your title is talking about the lost trail but I think that you know how do you find opportunities where something can be misread or misinterpreted or tell a new story I think is really interesting in the project but thanks Arman. Um, uh, we should probably move to the last project um, in the session, which is um, kind of it takes us, it takes, I guess, the idea of storytelling to a kind of more, uh, a bigger scale. Um, it's by, a project by Shreya Kochata, who's in Diploma 13, and she's going to be talking about the disobedient landscape. Namaste. Hello, everyone. My name is Shreya Kotecha, and my project is titled The Disobedient Landscape tracing the territorial line over a fluid geography. As a part of Diploma 13's brief nation state, my project investigates a 61 kilometer patch of river line border between India and Bangladesh over Brahmaputra as a nation building apparatus. Time and again, in 2019, the government of India announced the rollout of NRC along with CAA, the entire country. NRC stands for National Register of Citizens, which is census updation exercise that is principal aims to reevaluate re and negotiate the citizenship of each inhabitant in India. It demands a proof of residence within India before 24th March 1971, the date of Bangladesh liberation. It therefore acts as an instrument to identify the so-called Bangladeshis in the Indian population. As a neighboring region to Bangladesh, the northeastern state of Assam become a test bed for its implementation. In, in Assam, the NRC was sold as a process to curb the influx of Bangladeshi migrants. The following video of Home Minister of India, Amit Shah's speech, presents the agenda that NRC was implemented with. दिमाग की तरह चाट गए हैं देश के भविष्य को उनको उखाड़ फेंकना चाहिए या नहीं उखाड़ फेंकना चाहिए असम के अंदर बांग्लादेशी घुटपेटियों की संख्या बहुत बड़ी आप मुझे बताओ अंत तक जो पीछे पोस्टर तक खड़े हैं बांग्लादेशी घुटपेटियों को देश से निकालना चाहिए या नहीं निकालना चाहिए एनआरसी क्या है एनआरसी ये देश में से असम में से इन आसाम में से बांग्लादेशी घुसपेटियों को चुन चुन कर निकालने की व्यवस्था दो हजार उन्नीस वाइल द एंड ऑफ ट्वेंटी नाइनटीन सो वाइड स्प्रेड प्रोटेस्ट अगेंस्ट दिस एक्सरसाइज एट द सेम टाइम द फर्स्ट डिटेंशन सेंटर स्टार्टेड बीइंग कंस्ट्रक्टेड इन आसाम टू हाउस अप्रोक्सीमेटली थ्री थाउजेंड पीपल आइडेंटिफाइड एस फॉरनर्स through the process until they are sent back to Bangladesh. The census, the census exercise that, that aim at identifying not its own citizen, but more the so-called illegal immigrants or transgressors of the territory presents an important apparatus of nation building. The border drawn on the map marking its territorial extent. A border drawn on a map marking its territorial extent is the initial site of violence, licensing other hostile state practices. The Radcliffe Line drawn in 1947 by the British Royal Sir Cyril Radcliffe had formed the imaginary of what it means to be an Indian. Today, 
In this manner, the red cliff line dividing the two states presents the initial site of violence, licensing other violent state practices. Furthermore, in Assam, a specific community has fallen prey to this imaginary. The Chaupari or Mia Muslim population originating from Bamaputra River Island called the Chars. Political scientist Sanjeev Bharoub explains as borderlands, the Chars and subsequent inhabitants become the synonymous to Bengali speaking Muslims of dubious nationality in Assam. Over the, over the Choras have often been stereotyped and derided as Bangladeshi. The Chars are riverland, river, riverland island in Mamaputra River that runs through Assam and Bangladesh. London ki tulna mein, ya island ki size zone, ya Brahmaputra ki size zone one ke... The Brahmaputra river size is, is, is 10 kilometer, which in reference to London is diameter and slightly larger than the area of zone one. The high sediment content is both the reason for the formation as well as the erosion of the fertile lands. The sedimentation facets show different layered deposits that form the char. This area is heavily prone to floods during monsoon, which is also the time the high sediment content leads to erosion as well. In the part of the world where land itself changes and where the population has been fluid throughout the ages, how can one decide who is Indian and who is Bangladeshi? In this manner, the ever-moving landscape itself rejects any effort of board, border being used as device to organize the space and identify its habitants. Under, under this military master plan, several surveillance systems are deployed to the main the border. Using information release available in public domain through news articles and YouTube videos, I've tried to specialize and reconstruct this master plan of virtual border. And all the BOPs are there. So this is the image 
radar image which will be uh, coming to the command center and then the command center real time assessment of the feed will be done this is the uh, data that would come in and over there on that screen is the uh, real time output which is coming out of different uh, you know observations so basically all this integration put together one of the the technology deployed occupies not only the ground but extends to the air space as well as the riverbed it further broadens the imposition of border extending it into three dimensional zone the surveillance is directly connected to the command center on india mainland that allows continuous monitoring and immediate deployment of military personnel on the detection of a mobile body or in the military terms intrusions the the following yeah this project this border project further imposes a line on the landscape with surveillance technology detecting any moving object as a possible intrusion it further criminalizes the char inhabitants and their mobile culture While this technology on charts extends to create on the third zone of the border, and this virtual border is extending from the land, and the border project in this time the project demands a new reading of the landscape because of the military is an interaction between the two and they make a face and where you can see the mobility there and and because even active technology this border master plan and is try to alter the nature i'll was when in his sn politics of verticality talks about the geopolitics as a largely flat discourse a cartographic imagination that does not account for landscapes of fluid nature इस परियोजना के से मैं इस फ्लूड नेचर को एक नई नजर से देखना चाहता कि मैं इन दिस टर्म कार्टोग्राफी दैट डज नॉट प्रेजेंट दिस लैंडस्केप एक्यूरेटली वी नीड टू लुक फॉर अ थ्री डायमेंशनल डायनामिक काउंटर कार्टोग्राफी और काउंटर मैप ऑफ द स्पेस मिलिट्री के इन सोफिस्टिकेटेड उपकरणों को उपयोग में बिकॉज़ ऑफ मिलिट्रीज ऑल दिस सोफिस्टिकेटेड इंटरवेंशन can can we see that in the architecture can we disperse the concentration with the help of satellite we can develop a better understanding the project argues that the solution lies in reading the movement of landscape rather than that of the people और ये मेरे कुछ नेक्स्ट स्टेप्स हैं प्रोजेक्ट को आगे बढ़ा दैट डज नॉट प्रेजेंट द लैंडस्केप एक्यूरेटली वी नीड टू लुक एंड आई एम थिंकिंग अबाउट द मोर डायनामिक कार्टोग्राफी सच एज द रिवर बेड रेट ऑफ चेंज ऑफ चार्ज एंड द हाइब्रिड कंडीशन ऑफ द लैंडस्केप और फिर इस टेक्नोलॉजी को कैसे एंड देन how can we use this technology on the scale of the body 
to move it towards the scale of the landscape or fir i'm thinking ki iski accessibility and, or iski use yeah. and i want to look at its accessibility and the usage okay, okay. so now please some people want to see how the floods are and i want to see because the, every year there is a flood here and how can prevention can help that thank you shreya that was an amazing presentation um and i mean i just loved how you not only talk, like were able to translate it so well but i think also to talk about how you can sp span this idea of the border as like a site of violence but talking about it at the scale of the landscape at the scale of the human and all the scales in between so yeah it was really really rich project and already so much to think about with still lots of time left in the academic year to push it even further so i just have one question because my entire project was uh geospatial imaging and um i i i would want to know more from you regard with regards to the critique of it with regards to the critique of remote sensing in your project it would be quite interesting for me to to understand that as well because with the the techniques that i'm deploying right now they are not necessarily or i would like to kind of say that they're not necessarily two dimensional um and nor is um, um geospatial imaging but i would like to know more from you with regards to i i'm still researching on that um like one of the question that was asked to me uh, recently was why are you doing this project when in fact the satellite can show the movements of char like satellite imagery does that already and i started thinking about what like what scale does geo uh, spatial imaging go to like what is the um, what is the scale of like what are what is the frequency of photographs that i can get in a year or to what detail would it go to and is that detail enough for understanding this landscape and the fluidity of this landscape and how can if that is enough to understand the culture that this landscape actually carries so yeah i'm actually studying it more like that's my target for next week yeah no, but scale is a very good point by you because that's what i'm currently dealing with as well so scale is a very good point actually yeah i mean like um the like the idea of the pixel i think um for mm. in one of the books of forensic architecture they talk about it like what to what extent uh, like can uh, can we see an image in public domain and like the the most interesting thing about this project for me like what's doing it is um i mean although i am critiquing what the military is doing there it is simply ingenious like the amount of information and the like the tools that they can use to impose what what is seen by the state as the correct uh, way so mm -hmm. I feel like as an architecture student there's a lot to learn from the military and the tools yeah yeah I, uh, I really enjoyed the presentation thank you uh, just a quick question have you considered um topics such as oral history or place memory are these parts of the accounts that you'll be looking at uh, as formats of accounts and how you're auditing space yeah i'm actually uh, trying to talk to a few people um who inhabit this landscape or like uh, who origin uh, who have their origin from this landscape and uh, there's some like really good mia poetry going on which kind of uh, is being used as a tool to talk about what's happening there um the issue is like the current climate in india um i don't know if uh, like the people i talk to they do not want to um like be known or be part of the project and i completely understand because it it is really scary right now like you can't even make a joke so uh, let what about uh, previous accounts i'm sure that the either internet or through 
folk folk history there must be format there must be old accounts or things that have been written before yeah, it can I'm, be the sources, yeah. yeah I, I i'm yeah i really want to look at it more um it's quite a remote area and the people talk in bangladeshi um uh, sorry bengali which i do not understand much but yeah i am oh well, you have yeah. friends who can help you <laughs> yeah yeah i have to ask him to do so i think just going on from the comments that have been given it might be a useful juxtaposition or contrast to your critique of gis um and other kinds of imaging which i sympathize with the last time i tried to design anything in architecture school it was um around the slums in mumbai although i am from bengal but i was addressing slums in mumbai the population of which is also estimated on the basis of gis which if you've got any familiarity with slums in india the idea of estimating population from geospatial imaging of slums is patently ludicrous and of course answers the question as to whether it's adequate or not to understand the culture of course it's not um but i do share you know i think in india things like mobile phone ownership is pretty damn high i think it's like more than one handset per person on average or something insane like that because well again if you've been there you know um so i do appreciate the sort of questions you're asking as to it's a lot like capital the data isn't necessarily at fault the tech isn't necessarily at fault geopolitics i think there's a misapprehension the only note that i was like hmm? in your project geopolitics isn't at fault it's the way that statistics or static images are utilized that is where it becomes dangerous the processes themselves aren't at fault it's it's the sort of systems that decide to use them in particular ways visualize them in particular ways um well let's just say utilize them in particular ways but the actual function um and you know if we think about it from all the other sorts of concerns around personal data the fact that you know having one of these means a hell of a lot can be tracked about you and then all of these people even rural farmers especially rural farmers have this data with them so i think there are there are kind of really interesting questions that you're um project raises and yes agreeing with i wonder if it's clear to the people who perhaps don't have um that much proximity to indian culture if it's clear how disturbing a lot of that vt was um and if it's not maybe that's something that you ought to deal with in the way that you present the project because literally it was really uncomfortable i was when i said about a trigger warning next time i meant it um but that's good i'm not saying take that out of your project in the same way that we wouldn't say take folklore and kind of oral history out of your project because it's difficult to talk about that's all the more reason why it must be there but we ought to know why it's there perhaps use it to critique the other things ease on the ground or of the ground to critique above the ground perhaps I just want to say one, one more thing. It'd be really cool to see how uh, the military could could be an agency for the for the communities living there. I don't know how that works. I don't know how that works in India, but it would be very cool to see because as you just mentioned about the kind of the um, you know the ingenuity of the uh, military techniques that they're that are being deployed. I don't know how, but maybe it can become an agency of of an agent of change, rather than survey. But I don't know how that works. But it's a kind of an interesting proposition. I was just thinking. On on that note, actually, uh, Mariana Mazzucato talks quite a lot about how the state um, builds and creates sort of these technologies, which I forgot I was meant to be speaking Hindi. Whoops, uh, <laughs> that the private sector. benefits from so this this is a slightly different angle of this conversation but it's it, it's more about how the state has this uh research and innovation but then it's the private sector that reaps the benefits so the iphone the technology that's used in the iphone is actually based on military technology the gps system in america 
but it is the uh, that it is Apple that has reaped the kind of commercial and financial benefit rather than the state. So, um, so that's something that's quite interesting. And then I guess from my perspective, it, I mean, as Shumi was saying, it's very provocative and it's really hard to watch these things. And um, it's easy sometimes to block this out that this is happening. <laughs> um, so I think that that's interesting. And I guess. Um, for for me, my interest in our page is always about people and who, and and so I guess just understanding a bit more about how these people live in in this. So I, I totally understand the the interest in the geospatial and, and the digital, but your proposal does need to have, I think, has to have a bit more about the people um, and, and what you think you are doing for them. Are you making it worse? By in some way, are you making their lives more in more danger by critiquing it as an architect or not? Or how do you kind of protect them? And on a side note, um, I'll give you my email address. I might have a friend who does, um, who will know a bit more political uh, situation in Assam. So get in touch. She's done quite a lot of work on the ground there. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, but amazing, Shira. Thank, thank you. Sorry, my I don't know my internet just cut off. Allah <laughs> They are watching you, uh, watching you. <laughs> I mean, okay, conspiracy theories aside, um, Shreya, maybe you were in the middle of saying something when you got cut off, so. Yeah, I was just apologizing. Uh, I should have kept a triggering warning. Oh no, that wasn't meant as a critique. That was meant as a, do you know how powerful your work is? <laughs> no, but still, I think, I think it's, a, it's a very valid point. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's also an invitation to ramp it up if you want to. Yeah. At least within the means that you feel comfortable, which is what we were all just suddenly thinking <laughs> when you left. Yeah, because it's incredibly brave to do this project, both as a current situation that's actively an unfolding, but also as a student that's like that's from India to do that to do this now and also to present it so i think it's to be commended and um i think the point as well about contextualizing it for those who aren't aware of it because of how little it's being reported in mainstream media is also really important because it's really important that everyone knows about what's happening as well yeah i mean uh in some ways like this project is also like me trying to understand what um what makes me an Indian like how is my Indianness or anybody's Indianness judged and like so I belong from Madhya Pradesh which is a central state so what way away from the borders and like I almost feel like being extremely inside is also like a protection that you have um, yeah. that's why we have the, the phrase heart or the word heartland right it's mm -hmm sort of signifies in a very corporal sense what you are at least supposed to feel. Any further comments from the critics before we go to the bigger discussion? I, I just want to say that, um, you know, I mean, uh, the mood uh, that was built during this last presentation. Uh, I don't know if it was intentional, or that's, the, that's who uh, Shreya is, but the voice, the tone, the way she spoke, uh, the way she articulated the content, uh, it completely you know, uh, was in sync with what she was speaking about. I, I don't know how, for some larger framing of things, but there was an earnestness, there was a seriousness, there was a depth, there was something that you know also led to creation of this mood and um, where there's a folk music she played, where there's other videos that she you know, uh, uh, played. And, and, and that's one thing, this is completely aside from uh, the work because I think we've already spoken about the work. Um, but the second thing I, I saw, and again, this is uh, maybe just the work, the universe that's firing in some way. She's talk, talking about, you know, um, landscape and borders and lines. I mean, this, this maps, lines on, on the earth in some way. And I see this, you know, young girl, um, you know, with almost like lines on her clothes. Uh, 
and I, I and I kind of you know said that is there some larger you know large universal conspiracy behind all this? I don't know if it's intentionally selected that you know these sharp lines cutting across her uh, you know what she's wearing. Um, I also thought of uh, the films by Anand Patwad and uh, we're talking about similar issues and and you may want to kind of uh, see them Shreya as well. Uh, they might inform you somehow. But um, I think everything came together uh, for this uh, presentation. Like I said, thank you. Thanks, Mom. Yeah, yeah. This was the only one out of the laundry. It was an intentional murder. No, it's true. It was cosmic order. We're allowed to believe in such things. I think there's a nice connective thread actually between these three projects that we've just seen. And actually there were some comments in the chat when Reva was presenting about um, how stories get appropriated and uh, used in particular ways um, to, I guess, illustrate religious narrative or a, a political campaign. And I think in your project, technology is playing a similar role as the story did in, in Reva's project and, and how, you know, everyone is very quick to look at everything through a binary lens. And I, I really appreciated the comment you made about the military being ingenious and how they deploy technology and that it's uh, there's things that we could learn, but then it's also about whose power or whose hands is that power in and how do you start to disrupt those power structures by really understanding how those technologies are being used. And so, yeah, I mean, I think like facial recognition technology, there's a lot in the in, in the press about, you know, how bad it is. But in India, it's being used to locate lost children. And it's, it, there's ways in which technology can be used and misused. And it's so much of it is dependent on whose hands it's in and how you connect that to the stories of the people on the ground. So, yeah, I think it's such a rich project. And I think there's, there's real power in that question when you asked who is Indian and how you said even personally for you, that's something you're thinking about. And I think even just organizing this jury has made me think about it so much in terms of like what it means to be Indian and how much language is tied to that, how much, you know, birthplace, passport and all those things that form your identity. So, yeah, maybe that's a kind of nice point to um, to kind of uh, open it up to the bigger discussion about all the projects we've seen today what was learned from kind of translating them, uh, presenting them in a different language to the language that they were produced in, but then somehow connecting them more to their context. Um, and I'd also really like to bring in the translators. So maybe we can stop, stop live translating, but actually have them comment on the challenges and um, I guess things that they uncovered while translating. So I'll, I'll stop the translation so that we can hear them regardless of what channel we're on. One second. So Amina and Nasneen, hopefully we can all hear you in one channel now. Thank you so much. I mean, what an incredible feat. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you thank so you, much. Thank you. It was it was challenging and stressful, but but we learned so much from this this event. <laughs> And you never know, we might pursue architecture <laughs> to study. I think based on the preparation that you did in reading everyone's scripts and getting inside all these projects, I think you're already halfway to an architecture degree, if not all the way there. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. yeah. The, 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 all the students, they have worked very hard. Mm. Um, so my comment, my comment would be that, you know, language is, language is something, but then the way the the structure is built in the in the context in the culture in the environment that tells you a lot about what's going on around that right so though you cannot translate word to word but you can feel you can feel it so this is what i felt you know that you you don't need to translate exactly same terminology from english into hindi but you need to have that feeling side of it. And um, I think in terms of the language, obviously, I mean, the thing is that we are all um, from like different countries and we, uh, we uh, for, for us, English is not our first language, but somehow it's always easier to express certain terms in English, you know, because if we say the same terms, we might have a translation of that term in Hindi 
or in another language but thing is that the for that term to be um uh, you know accurate and powerful you know sometimes it's best i think said in english explained in english so um i mean this is my i mean although there are many words that can that can be uh, you know um used in hindi in architecture as well but um, as you've seen all your students have actually struggled you know so they were all speaking hindi they tried to speak um, uh, you know quite well but uh, the thing is that there was still the element of switching because they found it easier to express i think it's um it's a uh, and uh, like uh, an expression as well which people find hard to you know say to be you. fair be fair we face the same problem in arabic as well actually yeah yeah i'm i'm sure it's become it's become a very global issue to be able to verbalize our profession yeah. within our language because of the technical expressions right yeah. and the nuances and being able to deliver particular phrases even if we all speak arabic it becomes very difficult for us to uh, use yeah. it if you put the effort it becomes difficult because i think sometimes it wouldn't make any sense because translation or interpretation is never literal when anything becomes literal it would lose its sense and the meaning you know so um i mean you just have to be very careful in using the words that are appropriate if you like what's what's a bit interesting to me is that um you know just thinking of the word like architecture since we are calling it um to um understand that that word uh, most normally we would talk in we would say the word architecture in english maybe there is some form of a historical connotation that it is uh, a western concept architecture as in the a profession and maybe the the kind of um meaning of architecture is quite in, highly different in in hindi because um the concept is borrowed in some ways and some and like language in 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 like in its sense is quite quite borrowed both in english and hindi like certain words for example would be very difficult to find the exact word in in hindi maybe because as a concept it is a western concept yeah i mean if i'm to comment to uh, on in, in the arabic definition for instance architect the, the closest word is engineer so there's no literal translation for architect what's the translation of architect in hindi sorry what's the word what's what is an architect in hindi what's the indian uh, word i could be wrong but i don't think there is one it's not architect it's Stapati comes close. Stapati was a master builder before the British came. As somebody's put Vastakar, Vastakar is perfectly kind of adequate. Uh, it carries it carries with it a lot of other stuff. Vastakar. It carries with it a lot of exclusions. Vastu being der- derived from a specific tra- traditional belief system, um, but there is a word that has its own politics. Likewise I think I learned from Leslie Locko in an African language architect is space magician. <laughs> yes. I'm putting that on my business card. <laughs> That's cool. I think um I was looking at one of the messages in the notes about how it's hard to translate words like um spatial analysis or I don't know uh, pedagogy i don't know there's all of these terms we use i'm going to be quite critical of the aa here and think actually i think the aa do use a very particular type of language to describe architecture um and it can be overly make it more academic perhaps than sometimes we try to i i think we can talk about architecture in a way that doesn't that uses more normal words and that's something you know i try quite hard to do to be able to broaden our audience and make architecture feel less like it's other uh, and then actually is it easier that to translate what we're talking about if we're not using words like liminal but you talk about the spaces that are in between which does translate as what you got you know like the, do we over complicate the architectural language 
I think that applies to simple words too, though. I mean, I was it was kind of struck between British English, Indian English, American English. You know, simple words like society. When when Salim was talking about a society, he wasn't talking about a subset of a civilization or a community. He was talking about people who all live in the same building, and in that sense, it was a housing society. Even the word like when we were talking about the lost property office, the 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 word property as a, a you know response excuse me, response to a parcel of land versus something that an umbrella that somebody owns. Like even within that, there's so much nuance. And I think what we're um, maybe reticent to remember as, as architects or as even just simply as people is, is how loaded some of those, those terms can be, even if they're not specific technical jargon to the, to the trade or the profession. Yeah, I mean, maybe because um, Shimi brought up Leslie Loco, she gave a lecture at the AA, um, I guess, two years ago now. And um, she was talking about how in most African languages, there's no word for public or private. Yet, you know, and given that so much of architecture is based or, or planning cities and spaces is based on that, those two concepts, um, she was surprised to see that it's not actually change the way people practice architecture like contemporary architecture in those places and so if those if those concepts don't exist in the language shouldn't the way we practice as architects change in those contexts and so i think that's where language becomes really interesting and in that we're just kind of assuming that architecture and the way we practice it should be the same regardless of context or regardless of i mean a, a cultural understanding of something and I guess, and then my other point, I guess, when, from the, some of the earlier comments was also that, you know, we constantly, in when speaking Hindi, or as Rashid was saying, when you're speaking Arabic, we borrow words that we can't translate from English, but maybe we should be doing more of the reverse as well. So when we can't express something correctly or like accurately enough in English, why aren't we borrowing from Hindi or Arabic or other languages? And another point I wanted to just bring up quickly, um, which I think came up in Tanuj's presentation, was about Hindi. You know, we always assume that English is colonizing languages everywhere. But I think in India, like the fact that Hindi is also kind of taking away from the rich diversity of languages present across the country um, by this kind of asserting this national language. And I think Shreya's project is done in a unit that's all about nation building and identity of a country and how it's really important that like Hindi is a national language, whereas actually India is not a country of one language, it's a country of so many. But I might get a bit controversial here. I mean, like language is kind of assimilative. And if I say Hindi is like the English of India, I mean to say that it's the sort of sponge that sort of takes in a lot. For example, I don't understand proper Hindi. I really like listening to kind of Urdu inflected Hindi but I probably best understand Bombay Hindi, which is what you get in Bollywood, which is a sort of pretty, um, how can I say, it's a pretty debased version of proper Hindi, and it's quite far from Urdu inflected poetic Hindi. Um, and again, all of those things have, have their politics. And I guess the point I'm making is that it's dynamic and it's assimilative. I'm not going to share my piece. I'm not sure Stuti would have agreed with that because in, in the South, you know, Hindi isn't the default language, it's English more than... I mean to say that language itself is dynamic and assimilative. Um, mm -hmm. And it's something that we ought to remember that it kind of takes on things from, from adjacencies. Mm. Yeah, but we also in Dubai, for instance, or in this region, there's a lot of people that use... Um, is words, Hindi words like Rasta, Darwaza, Shisha is a very typical part of our language. It's very typical. Um, so it's very interesting that the Indian language is also taking, or Hindi is taking another, I imagine, in places like Dubai, probably in places like Zanzibar as well, or, or Kenya, you'd have influences. Like, and this is geopolitics, going back to the last project. You know, the fact that Spanish contains a lot of Arabic words within it. Al-Mayra, al, al these are all, all the al words are coming from Arabic. That's obviously because of, um, you know, historic relationships between cultures. And so I think much as we can, as language is kind of divisive, it's really nice to find those cross points 
Um, and also just to kind of find words in other languages that articulate conditions that we have. Like if it was possible to explain to you what yar meant, um, then I'm sure that non-Indian people would understand what that means. And like in, in Bengali, there's a word naka, which you just know it if you see it, but it's just so hard to translate. But um, there's these sort of huge generosity <laughs> language that can open up as well. Do I hear a Bengali person laughing? No. <laughs> Um, I mean, one other, uh, one, other, one other observation from most of the presentations. I feel like although architects are, I would say, traditionally are keen to build, I think here I see more and more, I don't know if, I get, if you all get the sense, but architects feel like they have somewhat a civic duty to understand the politics of space and kind of making sense of it or trying to define it further trying to impose or uh, somewhat develop forms of, of spatial justice or social justice. I don't know if you guys get that sense. I see that more and more. Yeah, it'd be great to hear from some of the students about that, like the role they see of architects and how that's changing. Or, they, or what they're interested in beyond architecture. I think for me this year, like um, architecture became a tool to like analyze events and um, like spatialize everything that is ha like happening. So for example, like uh, when I started, I started uh, this year with just the register and RC and I started tracing it space by space to then come finally arrive at the border. And so like, um, I think for me, like this year at least, and maybe even in future architecture and my role as an architect would almost become uh, as a person who can analyze uh, and spatialize things. Like that's where I think um, the strengths of the architects lie. Um, and sort of also gives us some role in the Political scenario, like, but with uh, with with the skill that that's that we are comfortable with, yeah. Um, um, I I think that for me, um, architecture uh, being an architect is almost right now being like a pirate and kind of hacking into existing or kind of a, thinking of piracy as a concept of like hacking into existing systems of economy, systems of business, land or government and finding ways away from those. Of course, like there is this huge project, for example, uh, of, ec of ecological destruction happening. Instead of opposing it, what can we take out what, what can we take out of it and do something besides that? Do not like do not be a critique, do not just be a critique because sometimes that becomes quite easy to do, but kind of become a pirate sort of. I don't know how that, how that works. <laughs> I don't know how that works, but. I mean, if I had to say, I think for me, like this year and let's say this project sort of made me realize that like the sort of sensibilities that go into your design and how deeply they're influenced from like other disciplines, uh, not just like from a functionality point of view, but like from cultures and histories and like, it's just so, um, I don't know, distributed across all of the disciplines that when you're sort of working as an architecture student you're not just working towards the design but you're also working as a researcher you're also working as a curator you're also working as an artist so i think it's like i think that's quite interesting tanuj apur do you want to add anything yeah i can um 
like i remember having this conversation with with mark kumar from uh, like he's in dharmal in himachal pradesh and he said uh, like the moment you dig earth to construct is the moment you start destroying earth so as as architects uh, you have the knowledge and thus you have the responsibility to to be the bridge between nature and uh, humans when it comes to construction so i think yeah we have the responsibility to decide because uh, like he was an architect and he said we are as architects destroying the planet so we also need to take the responsibility how to you know like uh yeah make that in the best do that in the best possible way Tanuj did you want to add anything Oh I need to make you a co-host Oh thank you Yeah I I've just been listening and just trying to think and trying to bring back my own personal experience from working I suppose I took a quite a long break between bachelor's and masters of like 3 years of working and in that time working in D Dubai specifically there's a very interesting sense of what the architect is as a guy in service of let's say a developer and it seemed like we were always shackled to that sort of um you know service um service levels so i was coming to the aa it definitely teaches us as well a bit more about how to be a bit more critical and how to justify our actions and sometimes those actions are not correct and i suppose even with this project that i've been doing it's quite easy to fall into the traps of just designing another colonial project whilst critiquing colonialism and i think it's uh, important to be self aware and kind of see and yeah i suppose recognize what where we are at are we at the service level or are we going up to the planning level can we become developers one day so yeah can i add something there but I, it's really interesting that you're talking about being critical so i studied in mumbai till i was 16 and then came here to the to london and then did my undergrad at cambridge and what well, i really 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 struggled was was being critical because i personally felt like um and and you all might not agree with this but our culture uh, for me was this idea of like duty is so embedded in um in how we are brought up and and that your elders know best your teachers know best and you sort of need to kind of even writing a, a history essay i so find it so difficult because i've never been personally i've never been taught to think critically and i was talking to this with a few of my friends recently who teach architecture at different um places in across uh, across the uk and and it's suddenly something like switched in them they were like oh okay that's interesting we've never certain students perhaps do struggle to be critical and and now we can be a bit more um aware of that and i feel like maybe it's a question more for the aa perhaps is like when you teach so many students who come from all different parts of the world how um even the way to think is different not not even that this this speaking is the next part um yeah so i it's like really amazing what all of you are doing and being critical of of your environment maybe some some of you might i think are in india as well so it's really I really really have been super inspired by you today so thank you. I um I mean I, I get with this you know this idea that what is the architect really do uh, I mean where can an architect act uh, you know uh, and because of the scale and the and i would say the values that the education provides architects typically work on multiple scale in like i think one student school called the design city is designing habitats designing interior spaces and 
I think one of the key things that, you know, various uh, educational uh, mediums uh, provide our values. And uh, what I'm seeing today uh, beyond projects are also, uh, you know, uh, kind of deeper understanding of values uh, or at least, uh, you know, a response or forming uh, of, you know, values, which in some way, um, you know, help uh, construct um, who the person is and how that person eventually acts. Um, so the values that you kind of, you know, uh, build right now is what you will take with you uh, for the future. Um, and that's one thing. The second thing I want to talk about is the idea of Pechan and uh, this idea of language and identity and clothes we are wearing and you know, who we are. Uh, I don't want to be apologetic about not knowing Hindi. I, I know Bombay are Hindi. Uh, I'm, I'm Gujarati um, by you know, mother, and I knew that equally bad. But uh, it's the idea that we ex the experiences that we go through, um, uh, which actually at a very formative age, I went to a convent school, uh, right? I, I started thinking in English when I was six years old. Uh, I mean, that takes away, it distills everything out, uh, this pecha and this, this culture, this language, these nuances of who we are. Uh, but it adds other things as well. Right? I mean, I'm not uh, being a positive about it. Uh, I think uh, now more so than ever, we are compelled to think about this global network, whether it's Facebook or Insta or Twitter, and, and, and the language is used to communicate globally. We, don't, we just don't speak to our friends anymore. We speak to countries um, uh, individually. Whatever you post, whatever you, you know, record, whatever you say on, on the net, it stays for eternity in some way. Uh, and, and very often that, that kind of is in a language which is global. And, and, and right now, there's this, uh, I would say, um, I think India is, is anglicized in the term English because of the, of the education, uh, nothing more than that. I mean, and that's linked to the, of course, history of that. Is there any college of in, in India where you can study architecture in Hindi or in Bengali or in, in, in Tamil? No. Is there any higher education available, engineering in the languages? It's not there. How can you expect uh, anyone to think about architecture uh, when the entire model of education is in is English? You think of fenestration, you think of all the words that we spoke about. Um, and uh, I mean, that's also the, the way we've structured ourselves at a, at a social level. So um, I, I'm very happy to, you know, see this attempt to kind of question even the premise of using English as, as, a, as a language of communication. Um, and I'm happy to be part of this, uh, Julia. I'm happy to have trans required translators. Uh, and that's interesting. Um, it's almost like we require, uh, you know, additional support to help us communicate in, in our own language. Uh, and it has been kind of, taken away uh, by whatever you know, larger scheme of things. But having said that, um, all the project titles, uh, I think I was fascinated. Like just to hear disobedience uh, of, of the landscape, because it, uh, uh, disobedience of, uh, I, I normally make notes, but disobedient landscape, uh, for example, you know, the, I mean, it shows such a command over even a foreign language. Uh, and the question of what is foreign, what is, you know, what, what you own, what is your HR. I don't know if, for example, if one would translate even these, these titles, uh, what would you, what would be the outcomes of those? Um, it may become uh, interesting. But thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. I, I, I don't want to take too much time. The other viewers uh, also are, are there, but uh, it was deeply, um, deeply energizing in some way to be part of this discussion. Thank you. I'm conscious of everyone's time and I know this has been a quite a long session and I guess um, for people in the UK, they are probably like very hungry because they haven't had lunch. But um, um, I, I think there are just so many interesting things that came up over the course of this discussion. And I I think this idea of who's the audience for the project, but also who the architect is and what your role is as an architect was really interesting. And I think Anaita, your comment about being a pirate, I really liked, but um, I think in, I think what's really interesting in, in architecture school is that you're taught 
a way to think about not just design, but like ways to see connections in the world. And I think the range of projects today really showcase that, like in terms of like the a vast array of scales, but also topics, stories, um, and ways of communicating that. And I think the expertise as an architect is really should be in communication because that's how we work in the profession. We collaborate constantly with so many people across disciplines um, with, uh, to communicate to ideas to clients, um, to the public. And I think we need to remember that in how we develop our projects as well, that that's, that's our expertise. And I think sometimes we, we get so excited myself included in, in terms of like what we can borrow from other disciplines, but really we should be collaborating with experts in those disciplines and, um, and bringing to the table our expertise. And so, yeah, I think that that's, that's something that really struck me across all the conversations, like how, where you, where each of the projects were really talking to experts in that context or a range of experts, they really came to life. And I'd encourage all of you to continue to do that. And to also think more about like what your expertise is as the architect, like what do you bring to those conversations? And you all clearly have so much expertise from how you've presented these projects today. But um, yeah, I really thoroughly enjoyed the conversation and was really pleased to, to benefit from the expertise of our two translators as well. Um, as yeah, like I grew up in South India and you know, there's so many different languages that are spoken in Bangalore in the city where I um, lived. And I think it's it's really interesting to, I think Salim, your points about like, you know, even within India, like, you know, there's so many different versions of our language and also so many different languages that shape kind of who we are and how we think about our culture. So that really resonated with me. Are there any final comments before we close from any of the students or jurors? I really want a hug. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I really felt like this whole event was amazing. It just felt, although we're all very separated right now, um, I think it, it was a great way to connect people across different places um, and uh, with so many amazing ideas. So I, I think this is just the beginning and I hope I hope for the students this has been useful for your projects and I really appreciate you all signing up to be part of this because it's obviously an extra work to do to think about how to present your project in a different in a in a different language to what it was produced in and i hope it's really helped you kind of think about it in a different way going forward and so all the critics i mean the feedback was incredible and um i also really appreciated you taking on the challenge to like kind of give bilingual feedback and um, to spend so much time with us. So really thanks so much. And obviously to the to the amazing translators, um, Amina and Nazneen, thank you for all your efforts. We get the <laughs> um, you guys are incredible. I, we did our best, uh, but please uh, forgive us for any shortcomings, <laughs> but we did our best. Yeah, we, we, we tried to do whatever we, we could and I hope um, it, it made a difference, you know. No, it, it definitely great. did. You. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, honestly, and thank you to everyone behind the scenes who made all of this happen. Tom, Liam, Catherine, everyone who helped us test out doing this on Zoom. Um, it was you know, a real a challenge to start with, but I think what's been great is how many people around the world have been able to tune into this and be part of this conversation. And the chat has been alive with amazing comments the entire time. So I'll, I'll download that and share it with everybody so that you can all read it if you haven't had time to, to kind of be part of both conversations. But thank you all so much. Thank you. Take thank care. you. I'm trying to do a mass unmute so everyone can do a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.